What's up? Um, welcome. You're on the Stealing Signals YouTube channel. This is going to be a post about Omni Fantasy. Um, so probably if you clicked on the video, you know what Omni Fantasy is, or you're a subscriber to the Omni Fantasy Substack. If you don't, I'm not going to go over all the basics here, but if you don't know about Omni Fantasy, you can go to omnifantasy.substack.com. That is a, a free newsletter where there's a you can scroll through the past posts. I think I started writing that newsletter in 2021 when we launched the site. Talks a lot about it in in brief. Omni Fantasy is a, a fantasy platform where you draft different teams from all different sports leagues, and you get points when they win championships and those types of things. Um, and it's you know, been around for a few years. It's not anything crazy. The site is, is uh, you know, coming along slowly over the years, basically built it from the ground up to be able to host fantasy sports. And, you know, there's not really a way to monetize it or anything. It's just a very simple site and, and something that we're offering for, for people who want to play and create their own leagues and those things. And um, definitely appreciate all the people that are really into it. There's a few, you know, couple hundred people that are that are super into this in our own little corner of the um internet and the fantasy internet whatever you want to call it um so yeah i wanted to like I, I get messages from a lot of people right now we're running the omni cup again anyone watching this anyone checking it out later probably knows what the omni cup is but it's 19 drafts um and one big competition right no real prizes we're all just doing it for pride and and to nerd out a little bit um there's 17 different sports leagues in it five flexes 22 picks for everyone who's drafting uh i've pulled together adp for it that you know i've sent out through the omni fantasy newsletter um i'm just gonna pull that up now because why not um let me zoom in on this a little bit but yeah i mean i kind of just wanted to do a show talk through some of the adp some of the stuff that i think was smart some of the stuff that i think was maybe not smart give sort of some of my opinions because a lot of you guys have kind of asked what i think obviously i do fantasy football analysis for a living i don't pretend to be an expert on all of these different sports but i do enjoy analyzing drafts and these types of contests and um I've been doing this for a decade now, have some experience with it, have obviously written some of the other stuff uh, over on the Substack that has been strategy focused. And um, so, yeah, I'm happy to share my thoughts on it, but also I don't, you know, pretend to, to know everything. Um, but it's uh, it's a fun thing. And, and yeah, I mean, you see you guys thanking me for the work on the leagues definitely takes a lot of my time over these couple of weeks uh, in, in February while we're running it. It's kind of like I just shift to making this my my full-time focus for a while. Um, you guys are welcome. Appreciate that you guys enjoy it. It's a fun thing. And uh, I wish we could do like more with it, but I'm not really sure how. And it's already like enough. So it's, it's just this kind of weird thing where I um, carve out some time for a few weeks. And then after it's done, I'm like, eh. I'm just going to let it sit for for the next year and then try and figure out in January how we're going to make some improvements and stuff. So anyway, it's been fun for those of you who played it. I'm, I, I, I love finding one of the cool parts about fantasy and about the live streams we do and all this stuff is I love finding people that are like like minded individuals who enjoy um, similar concepts and stuff like that. I've loved nerding out about this since I started playing it. Uh, I think it was the 2014 year um and have played with my college buddies ever since we have uh, all the way up to 20 people in that league now so we split it into two 10 team drafts this year it's the first year we split it as of last year we were still at 16 but we had been at 16 for multiple years and it's a big bulky draft when you get to 16 i think the right size for these drafts is 8 to 10 those of you who did the omni cup the first year we had 12 team drafts I think that gets a little slow, uh, you know, when people take a while to pick and things like that. It can get people that are on the other side of the draft kind of checked out. I like the eight-person drafts, keeps things moving. You get on the clock. You can get the draft done in a couple weeks. Uh, you know, you 
build out your strategy and then you're back on the clock quick enough to actually execute it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a fun thing. And so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that I thought about as I was doing my draft. We're in like the 15th, 16th round. I mean, this is, it's already March 1st. So we're, we're pretty late in Omni Fantasy season for this year. No one's like doing their original research to start up a draft right now, or few people probably are because we're only a couple of weeks away from, you know, March Madness and, and some of these events that really start to pick up. Those of you who've played for a few years know that we got Champions League coming up next week. We got March Madness right behind it for both men and women. We got the Masters in April. We get the NBA uh, and NHL playoffs starting in April. So much happens in the first few months of Homina Fantasy, which is super fun as well. We get a lot of, of information by about June or July. You actually have like almost half the results usually. Um, I haven't figured that out now for the different sports that are on the site. We have 17 sports. Like I don't know even – I had the dates at one point, but I don't know when the Cricket World Cup even is. I think it's in the summer. Um, but we added cricket this year. We have all these layers and – Anyway, it's super fun to get <clears throat> all of the results that we get in the early going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people have already drafted. We're almost to the start of a lot of these events that come hot and heavy here in, in March and April and May. Uh, at the same time, like, we're all still kind of in draft mode. Uh, I, I've, like, every year I wish I would do more on strategy, but I'm working to build up the site before the stuff begins. And then as soon as the site's ready, I kind of, like, fire up the Omni cup and do some organizational stuff. And I don't really have the time to write up strategy and all that stuff. So anyway, this is something I've wanted to do. Talk through some strategy. Here's some of your guys' thoughts. Cause I get some of the one-on-one -on -one emails, but to do a little live stream, have a few of you sickos like me that want to talk about some of the things you were thinking for some of your drafts. Maybe we'll look at some of your guys' drafts that are here. There's only 12 people watching, which is perfect. We can, we can go through some of your guys' actual drafts in the Omni cup and uh, hear some of your guys' thoughts. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, didn't really have a time, an opportunity to go through some of the strategy stuff and, and, and that stuff until now. And I think this is the best form to just sort of talk through it. So part of the reason I fired this up was this morning I was on the clock and I took, uh, Alexander Zverev, uh, I think is how you say his name. He's a men's tennis player. Um, I got him in like the 16th round and he's not exciting in any way, shape or form. But, I mean, tennis is, uh, is an interesting one. Men's tennis especially has been dominated by Djokovic. Um, and I, I started digging into Zverev, and one of the things I found out about him was that in the last um, – I believe it's in the last 14 majors dating back to 2020, he's made the semifinals in six of them. And so I was looking back at the past results for tennis – Right. And I was looking at 2023. He made the semis in two of the four majors that we have for Omni Fantasy. Maybe not two of the four in the calendar year for 2023, because that includes the 2024 Aussie Open. I can't remember exactly which ones. Um, good question here. You don't want to prioritize filling the flexes because that caps upside. Is that right? We'll definitely hit on this. This is a good one. Will says he got sniped on Zverev. So. The thing about Zverev is he's never, I don't think he's ever won a major. You go all the way back to that, to 2020, and I say the six of the last 14, he made the semis. Um, 2020 is the last time he even made a final, but he made the semis five other times since then, in the 13 majors since then, and has lost in the semis every time. So that's part of why he has long odds to actually win the various majors. But when you think about that type of consistency and the scoring for Omni Fantasy, He's a really good bet for like 20 fantasy, there are 20 omni, omni points, potentially 30. Um, you know, if something crazy happens where like Djokovic dominates and, and wins like all four majors or something, there's a possibility Zverev could, Zverev could be. Um, so there's some people here saying you want 903. Like, I mean, I got him. Let's check this out. One of the things here, like, so I'm in League 16. I just took him at 123. So we have in column D, the lowest pick, sorry, the highest pick. So he's gone as high as 67. Uh, and I got him at 123, which is close to the lowest. He's also gone 131 before. Um, 
I'm actually going to go view, freeze the top row. So if I do that scrolling, we can see the leagues and all that stuff on the screen. Um, anyway, the whole reason I, I'm talking about Zverev at all is he's he just he's the reason I did this video. Is he, It struck me as this really funny thing that's like I'm doing all this research into tennis, and I find this guy that is not exciting, hasn't won a major, I don't think ever, hasn't been to a final since 2020, um, and for all intents and purposes, it's just like a really boring Omni fantasy pick. And yet I'm doing all this analysis and I come to the conclusion that he's this a really strong high floor pick. He was the fifth overall tennis player. I should pull up the uh, um, results from last year. I'm going to switch my screen share to our aggregating... Oh, that's going to be too much zoom. Are aggregating from the 2023 season. So this is, that's the women's tennis. This is the men's tennis. We also have golf here. So Zvera finished with 20 fantasy points over here in column H. He had eight total tennis points. These, you know, this is the way tennis is, is calculated. It's the four majors. You aggregate all the points. You have the total points. Then you get the same Omni fantasy structure for every sport, right? The winner gets 80, the runner up gets 50, the next two get 30, the next four get 20. I've had some questions about why 20 and not like 10. Why not 10, 20, 40, 80? That's a good one for us to talk about maybe on this video as well. It's another thing that like I've wanted to, to cover, but I didn't want to write out my thinking. Um, but we'll get into that. It's a good idea. Um, but Zverev, right? So he finishes with 20. He's not actually particularly close to Yannick Sinner, who had 12 fantasy po uh, tennis points, which got him into the 30 Omni point plateau because uh, he actually won the Australian. And I mean, the ability to win, or in Medvedev's case, he makes two finals and loses both at the US Open and Australian Open finals. That's how you really generate a lot of tennis points and are going to finish high, which is the point of Omni fantasy. You want to win titles, right? So Alcaraz, wins Wimbledon, Djokovic wins both the French and the U.S. That's how you really get up into these, you know, top scoring ranges in the sports where there's aggregation. Same as same with golf, right? Rom wins the Masters, Brooks, Kepka wins the PGA. McElroy, this was a year where things were really spread out. Two of the other winners didn't generate a single other point. So Wyndham Clark wins the U.S. Open, Brian Harmon wins the British, and none of them, that's why I have these other things here. It's the tiebreaker. Wyndham Clark ends up winning the tiebreaker because he was tied 33 at the British Open. His next best finish was better than Brian Harmon's next best, which was tied 43. They both had eight total points, which was just their wins. The win here, the win here. Um, so it's a little bit of a flatter year, but McElroy gets a runner-up and two other really strong finishes. Typically, to get anywhere near the top five, you probably have to have a win or a runner-up in one of the events, right? And that's something that Zverev doesn't really look like he's going to be able to do a whole lot. And yet three times out of four tournaments, he makes the quarters at least twice. He makes the semis. Like I said, he's made the semis in almost half of the events. I went back multiple years. This guy's like in, in a very top heavy sport. He's like one of those dudes. That's a lock for 20 points. Now I wouldn't take that guy particularly high, because to get back to, to Donovan Shea's question here about capping upside, man, like I don't want to take picks in like rounds eight and nine that I don't think have a legit shot at getting 50 or 80 points in their sport. Like that's the way that I think about Omni fantasy strategy is very similar to fantasy football. Like I want upside at all points. And yet when you get down to like the 15th, 16th round and you have to fill every sport, there's value in just securing a guy that you think has a really solid floor and is a really strong bet for 20, even though he doesn't have 50 or 80 upside, because I have to take a tennis player. So back to Donovan's point about flexes, I think this is an interesting question. If I had taken Djokovic, I probably wouldn't have taken Zverev, because I want my flexes to also be in sports where they have shots at, at real upside. And if I've taken Djokovic, I'm, I mean, I'm picking, this is going to be a year where Djokovic is the dominant tennis player and wins the 80. Uh, maybe you can make a case, what I was just saying a minute ago, if, if Djokovic wins three of the four tournaments or all four tournaments, that that makes it more likely that Zverev can win second, sort of similar to how McElroy got up into third, where it's like a little more concentrated, or I guess in this, I mean, basically the, the total golf points were lower scoring 
if I went to 2022, I think the top total golf points was more like 16. There are multiple guys in the double digits because there's four guys who get at least eight by winning a tournament. The fact that two of the ones that got eight by winning a tournament couldn't even get to 10 total is very unique. And it was unique in golf last year. But, but my point is when this happens, um, and a lot of times this happens because one guy dominates. Like if Ron would have won all the majors, then that can that can cause a similar effect where it doesn't take as many points to get into second or into third, which uh, might be something that benefits Zverev. So maybe you can make a case that the Djokovic and Zverev would be positively correlated because if Djokovic really dominates and sucks a lot of the points out of the ecosystem, then Zverev can finish higher. This is, but this is what I'm talking about. This is why I fire up this show. It's like, I mean, we can sit here and talk about the, the dynamics of just tennis. There are 17 different sports. We can talk about just tennis for what feels like an hour. And I don't want to talk about tennis for an hour. I actually think it's one of the least interesting sports because it probably is Djokovic or Alcaraz. Maybe it's Medvedev or Sinner, who are the other guys that had high um, odds this year. Sinner coming off the Australian, I think, is the third odds. And then Medvedev. And then after them, it's like, I mean, Nadal is the next guy. He obviously didn't, I mean, did he, he like didn't record any points last year. I think he's injured. He's old, whatever. Zverev, I think was like the sixth highest ranked tennis player, but tennis is something where it's like, you know, these four are probably going to finish near the top, these top four. And then you're kind of just like, who's going to get the 20? Uh, it's kind of like an early or late strategy, sort of like tight ends in fantasy football, right? You take your elite tight ends or else maybe you skip the mid-round ones and try and hit some late-round tight end value. There's some sports like that that I you know, I think similar uh, to, like, say, tight ends in, in fantasy. There's some zero RB type sports. There's some wide receiver type sports where you want to hit them early and you might even consider flexing them early. Um so anyway, we should uh, we should talk through some of the different sports, not just tennis. But I do think it's fun to talk through each of these different sports a little bit, like getting into – I mean, we're already 17 minutes in this video. I feel like I just started it because I've been talking about Alexander Zverev the whole time. And this was my 16th round pick, and, and I made it because I was like, well, prioritizing 20 as opposed to um, – because I have to take a tennis player as opposed to waiting even longer at tennis – when the the difference it's a 2v2 question right like if i went mls which i haven't taken yet and then um took a different tennis player later because the is going to go he's i i got one of the, the cheapest prices on him we just looked at that if i go mls and then a different tennis player later my 2v2 is going to look like a potential zero at tennis and that mls team is probably no different than the one that i could have got down later where I'm taking Zverev plus that MLS team and I'm locking in 20. I feel like I'm locking in 20. I think he's like 80% to get 20 points. And, and that's why, you know, even though I don't think he has much upside at the point in the draft where I'm at, I went ahead and made that pick. Um, enough about Alexander Zverev. I'm going to get to you guys' comments right now and then um, circle back to ADP, which I'm going to pull back up. Because I think that's really fun to go into too. But um, Donovan says he went at 1308 in his draft. In 2023, I tried to focus most of my early picks on leagues that were in season or close approaching, just thinking that was the ones with the most information available. Curious your thoughts on that. This is a great one too. Uh, I definitely want to come back to this. Can I favorite comments? Oh, look at that. I just starred that comment. I'm going to, you guys are going to be learning as I go. Now, who, what was the other one here? Donovan, you don't want to prioritize flexes. I'm going to star some of these comments so I can come back to them and hit on some of these topics. Is there value to double dipping when someone has an actual chance of winning though? Patrick Cantlay has a real shot at winning a major. So would pairing him with Rory give you an edge? Um, this is similar to the Djokovic Zverev point that I just made. I think – so let's do that because it's similar to what Donovan said as well. Let's talk about flexes. Um, the way that I've approached it is I basically think about it two different ways. The first way is how many options within a sport have a legitimate shot of winning, of getting the 80 or the 50, of getting to the final. 
And that's different for every sport. We just talked about tennis. I honestly think there's only like four that have a shot in tennis. And it's probably more like two. Like there's different. Um, we talk about this when we talk about like floor and ceiling in fantasy football. You're talking about the 90th percentile, the 95th percentile, the 99th percentile. How high is the ceiling? What are you talking about? Because there are outlier events. But I think, you know, 90% of the time in, in tennis, it's going to be Djokovic or it's going to probably be Alcaraz. And then, you know, Sinner and Medvedev work in there as well. It's, I mean, it's, it's four, right? There's Zverev's not going to get there. I don't think Nadal is going to get there. He could win the French, but I don't think he's going to win the, the 80 in Omni Fantasy because that would require him to also probably make additional finals. And it's that he's just beyond that. He hasn't made, he hasn't made a deep run in any other tournament than the, other than the French in a couple different, a couple years. I haven't actually looked at that one. Um, and so the question of, you know, how many can actually make the run? And that's based on the sport, the structure, the playoff structure, a lot of different things. I was looking at cricket. Cricket's another one we're going to break down on this video for sure because it's a new one and I had a lot of fun looking at it. Um, I was looking at past cricket T20 World Cups and shout out Hassan Rahim who, who pushed for cricket. He was talking about uh, T20 is like a shorter version of the game's it's not as long as the, you know, the full day, whatever, you know, that we, I don't know a lot about cricket, but some of the, you know, some of the things I do know are like that they have some contests that can take like a whole day or like multiple days. The T20 has like a little bit more strict um, parameters and, and keeps the game a little bit shorter. So it's become a little bit more popular and, and whatever, uh, you know, easier to watch, I guess, something like that. Um, so I look back at some of the other stuff. One of the things that happens with it is it does ratchet up the variance a little bit when you talk about a little bit of a shorter condensed game the way that they structure the world cup is very interesting there's group stages the good team the good nations are kind of split they're sort of seated kind of like the world cup where you can kind of figure out who's going to probably win each group or, or at least advance there's two out of each group that are going to advance but then they're reseeded into a second group when there's eight so there's four groups two out of each advance it gets to the they call it the super eight or something super eights i don't know something like that and then it's re it's a, a new group situation, two four per, four nation groups, and they do another round robin. So it doesn't World Cup. You have group knockout stage immediately, one game knockout stage. Uh, cricket, you go group stage, group stage, and then you get to the semis, and then it's a one game knockout. And so when I look back at the past ones, and you look at who makes the the semis. The group stage is going to reduce variance, right? So, I mean, again, this is a great example of we can jump in really deep into each of the different sports. But this is the kind of stuff that I think is interesting when you want to think about strategy. How do you want to approach it? This is how I approach cricket. The group stage, round robin format is going to reduce variance. So variance is reduced up until the semifinals. However, or this is my hypothesis, as soon as you hit the semifinals, now you have a one game knockout round. Now variance is ratcheted up a little bit. Um, so what's the approach, right? I mean, World Baseball Classic last year had a only one group stage, but had a, a, had its own unique format and same thing. And I did a similar thing where what the what the approach is is for me is to try to plan out the easiest way to navigate the do two group stages and get to the semifinal where it's a little bit more of a coin flip. It's a little bit more of a crapshoot. Like famously in Moneyball, they talked about Major League Baseball playoffs are a crapshoot. How do I get to the point where it's a little bit more of a crapshoot and then something unique can happen? Another great example of this, I did this with Croatia a couple of years ago in the World Cup, picked Croatia later because I felt like their bracket set up well for them in the knockout round. They almost didn't advance. They got fairly lucky against Belgium in the last st stage of the group uh, stages. I, I might be conflating two things, but I believe this is right. Got fairly lucky to advance and then made a run in the knockout round all the way to the finals, and then ended up facing France in the finals. I think they lost like four to one in the final. I can't remember exactly. Maybe that was a close final. I'm, I've am i had Croatia multiple times over the years. They've made a couple of runs, and I can't even remember. I think I'm describing the World Cup before Qatar. Yeah, Argentina just won the last one. I'm describing the one that was in, in Russia, I think. Um but yeah, I remember Luka Modric, their, their midfielder who looks like Steve Nash. And anyway, the point was I felt like Croatia had an opportunity to um, to make a run 
in the knockout round. Similar, like Euro this year, I was looking at it. If you look at the way the groups, because you can look at, you can go to the Wikipedia page. Let's do it. Let's go there right now. We're kind of bouncing around. I'm going to pull all this back and get back to cricket and and, and talk about these different sports. But um, let's go to the act, like look at the actual. So here's Wikipedia, UEFA Euro 2024. Go down to the group stages. So you have the different groups. It literally lists the groups. You can see who you're up against. But the and then there's these playoff things. You can see it's it's purple because I've clicked on this to be like, which nations are going to come through this playoff potentially? These aren't being played until March. One team is going to advance out of this four nation competition. Like you know, like maybe Poland is the the favorite here. I don't I don't know. Um, that's not the main point. And this thing is like I don't think can be predicted. They rank the third place teams based on which groups. Uh, third place teams have the most points. And then there's this big formula where the third place teams get sent based on the four that advanced, what groups they advanced from. So if the groups they advanced from are A, B, C, and D, then they, they, they line up in these slots, whatever. The third place stuff I don't think can be predicted, but you can see the bracket for everyone else. And so uh, I'll highlight this little pocket of the bracket. Winner of group F is uh, likely to be Portugal if it's chalk. Turkey and Czech Republic aren't real strong. This playoff, probably going to be Greece. Um, but Portugal's got a good young team. It's not just a Cristiano Ronaldo pick anymore. I ended up taking them in the Omni Cup because of this. Winner of Group F here, they're going to play some third-place group. It could, it could be Group A, Group B, Group C, we don't know. But what's interesting is then if they win that and then they they win against the third place group, they will face the winner of two runners up. So in some situations down here, you have winner group E, winner group D. You have uh, the same deal down here with a winner group C versus two runners up. Up here, group A and group B will meet in the quarterfinals. So if you assume like the, the best nations do win their groups, which doesn't always happen, to be fair. But okay, Germany's a host, right? Say they win their group, they're playing at home, and then Spain wins their group. Groups A and B have two group winners. They go on, they win these matchups as well. Well, they have to meet in the quarterfinals right away, and they're two of the better nations. In the case of Portugal, you're looking at runners-up in groups D and E. Now, the other way to play this is to look at the runners-up in groups D and E and go, well, if my runner-up in group D or E gets hot and then wins – all they have to face is Portugal before potentially the semifinals. And this is where you can often figure out like a, a, a nation like a Croatia or something that can make a run all the way to the semifinals and then maybe get lucky and win against a heavy favorite in the semis as well. Maybe they upset a Germany. Um, that's how you get the runs to the final of like a, of a, a, a Croatia. So runner up group D and E, I think I've drafted them in a league as well. Um, yeah. Netherlands becomes a really interesting one. They're in the same group as France. They're a really good bet to be the runner-up here. France is probably going to win Group D. So Portugal, the hardest they could potentially face is Netherlands. Uh, and Netherlands is Portugal in, well, not the hardest, because theoretically France could get second in their group, right? A lot of things can happen. This is the other Group E. They have Belgium, which is, I, I think they're getting a little bit older, as I understand. And then Slovakia, Romania, another one of those playoffs. The, the runner-up in Group E is not going to be strong. Group D, if you have Netherlands as the runner-up, gets to play that runner-up from Group E, right? So Netherlands has a nice little path to the quarterfinals. So does Portugal. And then you have both of them are interesting because they play each other and they're not really the dominant nations. One of them is likely to make the semis out of this path here at winner match 46. And then they're... They're not the dominant nations, but they are good enough. And whichever one of them is playing well enough, say Netherlands and Portugal do meet in the quarterfinals, which they very well may not. There are upsets in soccer all the time in these in these tournaments, but that's like the, the toughest possible path, or it looks like the toughest possible path if France wins Group D. Say they get here. Well, whichever one gets here, let's say it's Netherlands. Okay, well, Netherlands just beat Portugal. They're probably playing pretty good, right? Like we can... 
we can make like if then statements where like, okay, they have an easy path, but also to get through it, they have to be playing decent. And then you're like, all right, well, they're kind of a live underdog, right? And then maybe they make the final. You'd prefer that to a really tough path where, I mean, some of these ones that maybe it's winner group D and E you have, you have Belgium is going to be facing probably France in the quarterfinals, right? Uh, down here at the bottom, you have winner group C versus group A and B runners up. Group C winner is likely to be England, but you have Spain and Italy and Croatia in group B. This is like the group of death. Like whoever's the runner up in group B probably beats the runner up in group A and then is actually kind of a threat to England in the quarterfinals. Like you could have Italy, England um down here and so again just like thinking through the path thinking through that kind of stuff is um is really is really interesting to me and that's how like that's how i did the year and, and so in terms of like trying to find value in an omni fantasy draft you're like okay well netherlands has a certain price whatever and when I get them at value, I I do think they have a, you know an argument for being a good pick at value. I took them in my other league with Pat and Pete and like JJ and Rich Rebar, and and we have a league that we've been doing for like four years with some of the fantasy guys. I, I took um, Netherlands over there as a flex, and so part of this is to get back to the flex. Um, and, and and Lawrence says he did the same thing; he flexed them. I already had, I think, France in that one i'm gonna actually pull it up go to my big board um yeah i had france in the second round i took netherlands that's actually really interesting too i didn't do this intentionally but i I, i've done i'm gonna get into similar with cricket france and netherlands being in the same group is interesting especially because uh third place teams can advance but um because there is a little bit of like one of them's probably going to beat the other one but if if they both advance which is a you know a moderate if but if they both advance, they, they won't match up until the final. They always put the runner up on the opposite side of the winner. So the winner is down here at the bottom of the group. Runner ups at the top. It's the same with every group in all of these World Cup and Euro contests. So flexing them, I, again, I didn't even do this on purpose, but flexing them with a team that's the favorite in their group. Now I'm, I've locked in the runner up from group D likely. I mean, Maybe I haven't locked it in because Netherlands could get third and like Austria could get second or whatever that was. But if France for some reason slips up a little bit in the group stage but gets a runner up, then I have France in this interesting path to the winner match 46. So anyway, I took them. I took uh, Portugal in the Omni Cup, both based on some of these thoughts about the structure. Now let's go ICC T20 Men's World Cup. Because I want to do a similar thing here really quick. Um, oh, this is all of it. Let's go to... See, I've clicked on the last like five editions. Let's do that real quick. The winner last time was England. Pakistan was the runners up. Like They're good, but I, as far as I understand, they're not great. Um, 2021... Australia won it. New Zealand was the runners up. Similar thing. Like New Zealand's good, but they made a final. That's interesting. Uh, 2016 West Indies won it. England was the runners up. Go back to 2014. Sri Lanka won it, right? India was the runners up. India is the favorites, and the 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 Premier League of cricket is in India. It's like the you know Premier League of soccer is in England. Doesn't mean India is necessarily that dominant. That they're the best, but we have not seen India actually win one of these recent T20 World Cups. They they it's not like India wins every year is the point. And it's been different champions every year. If you go through and look at the semifinals of each of those contests as well, you see the same names. And I guess we might as well do that. You see the same names in the semis. The problem is I got to find it in this very zoomed in thing, but you see here's the knockout stage. It's New Zealand, Pakistan, India, and England. Cause remember I was talking about how there's a, a round Robin and then a second round Robin. This is the results from the second round Robin. Because, or actually, I, I, maybe that's new. Last time it was a Super 12. So anyway, the fact that the round robin gets you to the semifinal is at least enough to reduce variance that likely the semifinalists are going to be good teams. 
you're not going to get like the Croatia run that I just talked about where, first of all, soccer as a sport is more conducive to upsets, I think. I don't really know about cricket, to be honest, but I, it is conducive in soccer. But when it's a one-and-done situation, especially because you can go to like penalty kicks, you can get upsets. Uh, and it's not like I'm trying to say Croatia is a really bad team either. They're good, but they weren't like one of the top five teams. And this gets back to my point about how many how many picks in a sport can actually win the 80 or 50. And in soccer, I think that number is a lot larger. And in cricket, I think it's like seven. It's very small, which means that I do. So then I, I, I started all this saying there's two things I think about. One is how many can actually win the 80 and the 50. The other is how likely are the top teams or the picks that I'm considering to actually get in the top eight, right? Or how how possible is it for a top team to get zero? And so that's one of the things that happens in World Cup every year too and will happen in Euro. It always happens. Well, it might not happen in Euro because the they have the um, third place in the groups can advance. But it happens in the World Cup every year where only two out of the group can advance where – one of the best teams doesn't advance out of the group stage every every World Cup. It was Germany recently. It was Spain after they had won like the previous two World Cups, and then the next World Cup they didn't even get out of the group stage. And you're like, I mean, these are dominant dominant teams, but um, even with a round robin, they don't even they, they can't even advance. If you go look at the odds to advance in cricket, they're like minus one thousand. You know, India's maybe larger than that. It's pretty confident, especially because like. There's like seven nations that uh, one of my other buddies who was advocating for cricket was like, there's like seven nations that don't fuck around in cricket. And then, you know, the rest of them are like the U S isn't winning in cricket. Like we're just throwing people out there. So anyway, when we look at the odds, um, I'm going to jump over to a cricket page real quick. Let's stop this. Let's present this. So this is just my Omni Cup draft. Um, when you look at the expected points based on the odds, there's basically these seven. It goes from you know 39 down to 26. And I think in this window, flexing is a really strong move. Again, um, I got to figure out how to easily click between tabs, but I'm going to go back now to this and say, again, the groups matter, but I'm, I'm going to get into this in a second, but uh, India and Pakistan are two of those top seven. Ireland, Canada, and the U.S. are not. There's not like some group of death issue here. And if you go look up the odds to advance, like the odds don't suggest that Canada or U.S. or anyone has a real shot to advance. England and Australia are two of the top three. Overall, these other three basically aren't live to advance. New Zealand and West Indies are in the top seven that I just showed you. Afghanistan has like mild odds to advance. These other two, not really live to advance. Um, and then Group D, South Africa is the final of those top seven. This is also an interesting one. So we have Sri Lanka and Bangladesh here. Netherlands and Nepal, not so... Um, Not so interesting when I go back to this. Sri Lanka. So the expected points, I've told you guys this before. It's not great. They're based solely off of um, solely off of futures odds, odds to win. Sri Lanka and Bangladesh only add up to like 20.5, and the Netherlands is like two. But one of those three nations is going to win 20. So the expected points is actually probably a little light here is the point that I'm making, especially when you have Afghanistan at 9.7, when they're actually most likely to be third in their group. If we really were able to bake in the formulas of the groups into our expected points model, you probably have Afghanistan down at like seven and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka would be bumped a couple points. So basically what I'm describing is that our expected points model is not perfect and could be tweaked a little bit, but that's where a little bit of edge lies. But if you're in the late rounds and Sri Lanka hasn't been picked, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh have very similar odds, but one of them is going to win 20 unless Netherlands does out of nowhere. And like you, It's similar to my Zverev point earlier. You're basically a coin flip to advance. Now, they're 
the reason it's similar to Zverev is they don't really have a shot to win 80 or 50 because it goes into a second group stage and they're going to be in a second group stage with three of these dominant nations up here and only the top two are going to advance to the semis. They're not going to, I mean, whichever advances from Sri Lanka or Bangladesh is getting 20 and they're not making it out of that next group stage. Like that's, it's a 20 point bet. I considered flexing them in my draft, but I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't actually want to flex them because I don't think they have a legit shot to win. I also have India in this one. But in my other draft I was just talking about, I did take two uh, cricket teams because I do think this top seven is really interesting in cricket. You're really high likelihood to get 20. So I was talking about the two things I look at. The second one is, would, would, would my pick get zero points? And I don't think in cricket... Any of the, I think these seven are like, it's possible that one of them doesn't get twenty, but they're all like, because that's a that's a strong parlay, but they're all heavily favored to advance and finish and go to the super eights, because there's basically seven good cricket nations and they're in that first round robin. Even if they slip up in one of those matches, it's still a round robin scenario where they're going to be able to beat the other two bad nations, and you know they they probably still advance. And so um, cricket is an interesting one where it, there's a high rate of likelihood that you're going to get at least 20 points. And then in terms of how many teams can actually win the 50 or 80, that was the other thing I said. You want a fewer – you want you want um, a smaller number, but you want it to be relatively flat. Like in tennis, it's a small number, um, but those guys go early, and it's probably – it's probably just Djokovic, like every year. is kind of the way that it feels. If it's a number like this where it's seven and also the expected points are pretty spread out, and I just showed you guys that like Pakistan won the title a few years back. Sri Lanka won the title even. That was like a decade ago, but it's not um, – <clears throat> I don't think India's like – I took them in the second round. I don't think they're like super strong favorites to win this. I do think they're really strong favorites to make – the semis and then it's like okay well i got a team in the semis that already got me 30 omni points and they're also favored at that point so i still felt good about taking them early but probably i actually wrote that i take notes on on my picks so i can kind of judge my process the next year and i actually wrote in my notes that i did regret this pick a little bit i probably would have preferred to just settle on like england in the third round and then my second round pick would have been something different. I think I had the option of taking the Celtics in the second round. And they're another team that I've written about the ADP a little bit before. They're another team that's in like the top nine of, of the, of the best ADPs. Um, to wrap up cricket real quick, cause this is a, a fun one. The biggest lesson that I took from this in terms of like alpha, if you're getting in a draft or if you, if they haven't been drafted yet, so after these group stages, two advanced from each group, we know how the Super 8 groups are, are configured. A1, B2, C1, and D2. A2, B1, C2, and D1. B2 and B1 is, is the one I'm going to highlight first. That's where Australia and England are both in Group B. It's tough to know who's going to get first or second in that group. They are second and third in overall odds. They're two of the top three nations, and there's a little bit of a gap after the top three. It's India, Australia, England. Those are your top three. Two of them are in the same group. They're almost certainly going to finish one, two. I don't know what order. It's hard to predict what order. But when they get put, they should both want to be the winner of that group because then they will fit, they'll settle into group two here. The A group is the next one I'm going to highlight. This is India and then likely Pakistan. And India is likely to win that group. They are the overall favorites after all. If they win that group, group one becomes India plus either England or Australia. So it has two of the top three. And then these two are probably in a tough spot. And I mentioned Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. They're going to be the D2 that's just slaughtered by India and or, or and England or Australia. The other one is C1 that gets a, a raw deal here. Whoever wins Group C, whether it's New Zealand or West Indies. Now, these two have similar odds. It's another one that I think is difficult to predict. You want your, your team to fall into Group 2, though, because instead of India out of Group 
A, you're getting Pakistan along with um, Australia or England. So you would ideally like to be C2 or D1. D1 is probably going to be South Africa. That's a nice one. They'll have a shot to make the semis. The runner-up in New Zealand or West Indies. But the thing is, maybe South Africa doesn't win their group. Maybe India doesn't win their group. Maybe Pakistan does. The, the conclusion I came to was Pakistan is the, is the nation that you like the most because they have the same group A as India. There's no way they can land in, in, in India's group in the next round. That's the one where, I mean, if they miraculously finish first in this group and India finishes second, they still don't line up with India, but someone else might line up with India that wasn't expecting to. Pakistan is going to be in a group with one of England or Australia and then two lesser nations, and they're going to have a real shot to make the semis as a result. And then remember, once you make the semis, it's head-to-head. You get that coin flip element again. Pakistan is the nation that I think has a decent shot out of those other four after the big three. Out of those other four, I think Pakistan has the best path to make a run to the all the way to the title. So like if I took India and then I, I maybe also took Pakistan, I'm thinking I can get the 80 and the 50. And so we go all the way back to uh, the, the starting questions. You don't want to prioritize the flexes because it caps upside. This is true. The, to this specific question, my point would be how flat are the other sports? It does cap upside, but I still have taken early flexes because in some cases I'm the opportunity cost is low. The other sports are very flat and I can push the other sports a little bit. And if I didn't get like Djokovic early, I'm already punting that all the way to the end. Some of the sports like college basketball, a lot of the sports that have a ton of options, college basketball, ton of colleges, right? How many teams can win the title in college basketball? It's kind of a lot. And how likely are the favorites to get 20 points to reach the elite eight? It's really low. It's lower than I think any other sport because they start in a field of 64 and they have to win three straight games just to make the elite eight that are all one and done games. And every year in college basketball, we see some of the very top teams not even make the elite eight. So for me, college basketball is one run. Like, look, I'm just, I'm not going to flex it because it, there's a, I mean, I understand that there are, um, there are late round options that, that make runs into the elite eight in college basketball, but a lot like how likely am I to get that, that team right? And I'm not very likely a lot of the years it's actually an undrafted. It's like, it was Florida Atlantic last year or whatever. Nobody drafted them. They made a run all the way to whatever, the final four or something. I can't remember. They, they did it one year. I don't know if it was last year. But there's always these teams that make the runs that nobody would have even thought to draft. It's going to be unclaimed points. Not likely that I'm going to go get this team that made the Elite Eight run. Meanwhile, if I take a favorite in, in college basketball, and I've done this before, even if they're like a two seed and they're good and they win the first two games and they make the Sweet 16, now they have a head-to-head -head against a three seed who's another good team, and only one of those teams is going to make the Elite Eight. Well, if the three seed takes care of business as well, that's one of the things about the tournament is you don't know the path because you don't know who's going to get upset. And so when you take a two seed and you took an early team that was maybe the fifth overall team, they got a two seed. They win their first two games. Some years you get lucky and they're facing an 11 seed in the Sweet 16 and they're able to move through them and make the Elite Eight and maybe even make the Final Four because the one seed on the other side of their bracket got eliminated and the path sets up very nicely. Other times um, they have to face the three seed. And then even if they beat them, they have to face the one seed. And it's like you, it's hard to just get to the Final Four when everything goes chalk in your bracket. It helps when everything goes crazy in your bracket which is to say that you can't predict the path, which makes predicting the um, unknown run to the championship really difficult. Like the years where like Butler made a run all the way to the title, um, you know, they got some help from other upsets or, you know, whatever you want to say. Like you can say that those teams were frauds, but whatever. Like they didn't have to play the hardest path to get there, or at least I don't think Butler did. I don't want to offend anyone who's a huge Butler stand. Um, so anyway, I'm, 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 I'm deciding which sports I want to flex. I'm not flexing typically the sports that have a lot of options that could potentially score a lot. I just showed in, in golf how like Wyndham Clark and Brian Harmon finished like in the top five because they both won one of the majors and that can happen every year as well. And those are another example of undrafted people stealing points 
So I take my shots in golf a little bit later when I can. I took Kepka in my draft. I, I really like Brooks Kepka. He's shown an ability to, to play up in, in, in majors. I took him a couple rounds ago before even this is a Zverev point because I do think Kepka has the potential to win the 80. He's won the 80 multiple times, actually, in the years that I've done Omni. And he just won a major last year. He's still – like he, they were just talked last year. He's back to form. Uh, he's been hurt in the last few years. So his odds aren't like super, super high. But I was willing to take him uh, – stab on him in like the 14th. But I'm – I mean, and, I, and last year I took like John Rahm in a, in a draft because like I do think you can – Typically, the, the winning golfer is one of the top like three or four best golfers in the world because you do have to finish high in multiple tournaments. Like the Wyndham Clark and Brian Harmon examples, they won one major and they didn't even finish top 16 in any of the other majors. Um, so you can have that one great tournament, but you're not good enough to do it in enough tournaments to win the 80. So usually it is like, I think John Rahm won it last year and a few years back, Kepka won it. I think back-to-back years. And it's like, you know, the guys that are able to consistently compete in multiple tournaments and win one of the majors, that's the guy that's going to win the 80. So I have taken some shots on like some really high-end golfers that I think can win it all. But as soon as those guys go, I'm like, I'm taking golfer at the very end and I'm not flexing it, right? I'm not flexing college basketball. Um, I don't know enough about women's basketball or college basketball. So I've decided not to flex that either. I think there's it's getting like there's more options that can win it, but it does seem like a sport where even though it's a 64 team field, it's probably only like a handful of teams that can win it. And those handful are probably really likely to make the elite eight. Like everything I just described about the NCAA men's tournament where it requires three straight wins. It's a little bit easier for the best women's teams to string those three wins together. At least that's my understanding. Women's tennis, another one where there's a lot of options. Men's tennis, there's a lot of options. Although I have flexed men's tennis. I took uh, Sitsapis, similar logic to what I was talking about with Zverev earlier in the show, where he's one of those dudes that like consistently makes quarterfinals and can get you 20 points at the end of the year for Omni. And so very late, I flex that. But Donovan's question is prioritizing filling the flexes early. Because there's opportunity cost, it caps upside, and I think he's right. I think you do want to be, especially in the Omni Cup. So let's jump into uh, my actual draft so far. I've taken early flexes in independent leagues where, like, it might be two early ICC picks. This is my – so this year I didn't – I mean, these are not – there's no flexes until – the Phillies were a really good value. And I had the Yankees and the AL and I I said, well, Yankees Phillies world series is very plausible. And then I also took the Kings here, Bruins Kings, similar idea, Eastern conference, Western conference, their outcomes are a little bit uh, uncorrelated. Their playoff run outcomes like, I don't like taking the Bruins. I actually took the Kings over the Maple Leafs, who have much higher odds to win the title. But right now, the Bruins and Maple Leafs, because they're in the same division and they're second and third in the division, they line up to play in the first round. So I'd be guaranteeing one of my flexes 20 points, but I'd also be guaranteeing one of them loses. And I want to maximize the upside where, like, the Bruins and Kings can meet in the in the Stanley Cup Finals, right? Like, Kings go on a, a miraculous run. Bruins this year... They're not as dominant in the regular season. Last year, they set the regular season points record or whatever, and then they lost in the first round of the playoffs. They're not as dominant in the regular season this year, but they come out and they play much better in the postseason. They play up to the level of the team that was that dominant in the regular season just a year ago. I know it's not the exact same team, but they're like one of the reasonable favorites to win the to win the Stanley Cup or to make a run out of a tough Eastern Conference. Um <clears throat> But yeah, in a lot of these rounds in here, like I didn't really ultimately like these three picks in the end. I, I put in my notes five, six, seven, and really four, five, six, seven didn't really go the way I wanted because I think I could have got the Hawkeyes later. Um, and even the Chiefs. And this is where I, I sort of regretted the India pick because I would have probably just went England here, but I didn't want to do an early flex. I probably should have taken the Celtics and then uh, England. But I started taking shots because this is the Omni Cup and you have to have a real ceiling. I started taking shots at 80. It's like, all right, well, the Chiefs are a shot at 80. The Hawkeyes are a shot shot at 80. 
Inter is not really a shot at 80, but they made the final in Champions League last year. And I do kind of subscribe to the idea that in some of these sports, um, playoff familiarity is helpful. Like they made a run with a similar team last year. Now they had a really easy bracket last year. I wrote about this a little bit in the newsletter last year about the Champions League. It was interesting the way it all set up. Some of the favorites got drawn to face each other in the round of 16 and then again in the round of eight. And it led to a really easy, ultimately Inter was the the the, the, the club that um, took advantage of what was a reasonably easy bracket for anyone on the, the, like the other four side of the round of eight. It was going to be some unknown, small, or not unknown, smaller, lower odd team was going to make a run all the way to the UCL final. And it ended up being Inter, and then they lost in the final. Um, I mentioned some stuff about Portugal. I actually do really like the Portugal pick. But then again, Rybakina was one where she was she struggled for me last year. I picked her in a couple of leagues. Uh, but she still had good odds, and it was another one where I was like, all right, I'm going to take some shots. Women's tennis does feel a little bit open at the top, but it also only feels like there's maybe only like five real options to get the 80 that have good enough odds to really be considered um, there. So I took them. I took the Yankees similar. I, I, they got Juan Soto. They're really good. I think that's a good shot take. I took Alabama similar. I think they, they got my UW coach, uh, Kalen DeBoer. I think he's a good coach. They lost a lot of talent, but – I think they could surprise because I think Kalen DeBoer is a good coach. Basically, all these picks, I was like, I'm not going to flex, and I'm going to think about how to win the 80 points. My other leagues, though, like this is my my main overall league, and like I flexed in the ninth. I did. I, I flexed hockey and and baseball in this one as well. Those are two of my favorites to flex. I flexed in the ninth and the eleventh. Looks like I didn't flex any earlier. And then let's go look at this one. That's still drafting. Oh, yeah, I had the 101. This one I double-tapped cricket at the 8-9 turn. It's only a seven-person league, but I took New Zealand and Pakistan for the reasons I was talking about earlier. And and th it does reduce upside, but like what I had to give up, especially in a seven-person league, what I had to give up in, at this point – in my NASCAR pick, in my NHL pick, et cetera. I also double tapped UFL because in a seven person league, this made me the only one who gets to flex UFL. And they're both guaranteed 20 points actually. Uh, Cause there's only eight teams and the top eight automatically at 20 points. So, and they're, they're both live to win the 80 as well. I mean, there's only eight teams that can win the 80 and I don't know anything about these teams, but um, I think being the one person out of the seven in my league that gets the UFL flex here is a legit advantage. Um, I struggled with this pick. I didn't, I don't really love the lions, but the NFC is kind of weak too. So I mean, I, I, I like the lions. I don't love them to be able to repeat their, their run last year necessarily. Um, just cause it, it was a big come up. And a lot of times there's a little bit of regression on those in the NFL. Anyway, um, in these ones, I was judging it that I could take the early flexes because I'm not, I mean, this was my first NFL pick. It's a seven-team draft. The Lions are a fine pick, right? Euro's another flex. I'm continuing to push certain things into the, the last rounds. I think I've taken three flexes now. Um, so it's a little bit context-dependent is sort of my answer to you don't want to prioritize the flexes because it caps upside. It's opportunity cost. It's the size of your league. It's you know whether it's Omnicup or an ind independent league, some of those things. Um, Ryan asks, is there value to double dipping when someone has an actual chance of winning? And so this was the other point I was trying to get at is like, if I'm, if I'm going to flex, I want to do it in a sport where there is, where my flex has an actual chance of winning kind of as he's saying. So I do the NHL and then there'll be NHL playoffs. And this gets to Michael's question. He tried to focus most on early picks on leagues where, that are in season or close approaching. I don't necessarily do that, but we do have more information that helps in the NHL specifically, because the NHL has really uh, notoriously um, unpredictable playoffs, but we know that there's like 14 teams that are definitely already locked in, right? Like we have a ton of information about their regular season, 
And that means that even if we think that it's so unpredictable that we have no idea who could win it, that there's only 14 options as opposed to like the NFL. I mean, yeah, the Chiefs are the strongest team, et cetera, but teams can come up. Like it's still, we still have a long off season. Last year, Houston had one of the lowest odds. And that by the playoffs, Houston made it to the final eight and they were a threat to make, you know, they make a run. The, the year the Bengals made the, the Super Bowl, I'm pretty sure they came up from really low odds. There's been some other examples in the past. The Bucks didn't have Tom Brady yet, and then they end up winning the Super Bowl that year. And they, for some teams, they were, or, or, or for some people, they were, uh, you know, undrafted in some of these Omni Fantasy leagues that year. So the point is, there's a lot of options in NFL or in some of these sports that can actually win. Um, and yes, the ones that are in season, you can narrow that down. For NBA, you can narrow it down. And so I think for flexes, being able to narrow down to leagues where there's fewer legitimate options to win, uh, I think is helpful because it's more likely that you're going to hit the Cinderella, if that makes sense. Like if there's only 14 logical answers and I'm I'm in the later rounds and I'm taking the 14th best team, that's better than taking the 14th best team in college basketball where there's like legitimately 50 potential options for the Cinderella is the 14th best team going to be the one that's the Cinderella. Is it the 25th? Is it the 35th? Who knows? Right. But if there's only 14 teams in a different sport, like, like uh, NHL that have a legitimate chance to make a run, then I want to cast my lot with that sport. Last year, it was the Florida Panthers. They did, they went undrafted in some, cause they weren't even a lock to make the playoffs. They ended up as, a wild card, and then they beat the Bruins. I just talked about the Bruins had the best regular season. They beat them in the first round, and then they just went on a run and made the made the finals. They were the runner-up last year, and they were, again, they weren't even one of the, I'm saying 14 teams that are like locks to make the NHL playoffs right now or close to it. They they were like one of the last two spots, right? They, they worked their way into one of the, the final wild card spots. During Omni draft season, I went back to my notes, and I didn't have the Panthers because I didn't – I wanted to at least make my shots in the NHL on teams that I knew would be in in the wild playoffs. Um, and they weren't even in there. I had some notes on them that, like, they weren't guaranteed to make the playoffs at the time that we were drafting in February. They were less likely. <clears throat> MLB, similar deal. I think, like, you can flex it. You can, you can kind of navigate who you think is going to make the playoffs. They don't always make the playoffs, but you can have a pretty good idea – and the, the number of teams that can actually win a title in MLB is pretty deep. But because, like, the Rangers and Diamondbacks played in the World Series last year, they were, neither of them had really, really good odds. But I like that the playoffs are pretty unpredictable, and I can kind of pick and choose the shots I want to take uh, in terms of who I think like has good enough, like I, I I guess it's because I know baseball. It's like the second sport for me, other than football. I know it a little bit better than these other sports, where I feel like I can pick um, who's going to actually be good. I think Juan Soto is a really good player, so I think the Yankees are going to be better this year as a result of getting him. They got a little bit of a deeper pitching staff. They still have Aaron Judge. Like I, I think the Yankees are legit. Um, so I went and took them. I took the Phillies because I also think they have a lot of good players. And so it's like I'm kind of picking my opportunities to make those bets because I do like the odds of them making the playoffs. And then it feels like a crapshoot once they get there in, in MLB as well. And it's a little bit of a smaller field, although they've been expanding it. I'm hesitant to make that point because they keep expanding it with the wild card teams. It used to be that only four teams would make the playoffs on each side. And so if you just won your division, you were locked into 20 points. And that's when I really liked to – I would chase like the Minnesota Twins because the AL Central was weak. And it was like if you can win your 20 your, – your AL Central, you win 20 points for that in baseball. Um, so anyway, that's – oh, that's a, that's a good reminder of – um, college football's new rules, which is a really interesting one where they, um, they're they still trying to decide what they're going to do in 2025. But my understanding for 2024, for this year coming up, is the top four seeds will be the highest ranked conference champions. 
and they'll automatically get a bye because it's a 12-team playoff, and the other eight will play to advance to play those four teams, which means that the ACC winner and the Big 12 winner are going to be locked into buys probably. So like Clemson or Florida State, Utah is going over to the Big 12 and has some good big – because like the Big 12 has been – like it's lost Texas and Oklahoma and stuff. Um, those teams are like the Minnesota Twins where they have a decent shot of getting directly to the 20-point plateau just by winning their conference. And then if you want to take a bigger swing out of a tougher league, there's also going to be, I think it's like seven at largest. I think the top five conference champions are guaranteed some type of bid. And then there's seven at largest. And my prediction is of those seven at largest, at least six of them are going to be Big Ten or SEC, which are now these two super conferences, in addition to their winners. They're going to be, their winners are going to be top four seeds. And then, I think there's going to be like three more wild cards from each of those. Maybe not quite. You know, I, I think there'll be, I guess that would mean that eight of the 12 teams came out of the big 10 or the sec. Maybe it'll only be six or seven. It'll be at least half the field is sort of what I'm saying. So if you're taking like Clemson or Florida state, you're hoping they win the ACC. If not, I also think there's an argument for going after, a big 10 or an sec team from the perspective of they're going to be less likely to get 20 because it's going to be harder to win those divisions. And then they're going to get into the wild card basically. And they're going to have to win a playoff game just to reach the eight, the quarterfinals and get the 20 points, but they're going to have less of a chance to get 20, but they're going to have better chance to get 80 or 50 because those are going to be battle tested, good football teams. You know, if you go take uh a team a little bit deeper in the Big Ten or a little bit deeper in the SEC, LSU or something, my Washington Huskies. I know people would say Oregon, but we all know that UW is better than Oregon. Um, Penn State, whatever. Like some of those teams, they might not win their conference and, and get the auto 20, and they'll have to go win a playoff game. But similar to the point I was making in, in soccer earlier, like if they do go win a playoff game, presuming that they get into the 20-point plateau – they might go up against like an overmatch like Clemson or something or Utah from the Big 12 and then and they're playing well. The point is like because they won that game, they're they're hot. They're playing they're, they're beating good teams. They might have a better shot to actually make this run all the way to the finals. You can I mean, man, you can break down every sport like that. So anyway, the sort of depending on what you are looking for in your build. But college football is another one where I tend to wait. There's a lot of options that can win in college football, so I tend uh, to draw from the later rounds. Any of the sports that have like a lot more possible champions and a lot of the ones that just have a lot more contestants, the individual sports, both men and women's tennis and golf, a lot more options, right? And then the college sports, there's a lot more options that are available those are ones that I tend to push later into drafts. The ones I, try, I tend to prioritize early are the ones where I think there's a limited number of – but, I mean, I, I don't stick to this strictly. Like I took um, – right here on the screen, I took Georgia early. I took um, Kansas City early in a different draft. So, anyway, uh, I want to go I want to go look at the ADP as well. We're already over an hour. I'm having a blast doing this, but – I want to go through ADP in the Omni Cup a little bit. I want to talk about some of your guys' teams. I'm going to go through the comments first as well, though. Lauren said he always thinks of Omni in terms of Cliff's tiers and then try to pair that with teams athletes who have moved their odds over the past week or two. Love that. I mean, I love the idea of, like, the Cliff's tiers thing is totally what I'm doing. And when I was talking about 2v2s two, two and using your flexes when it's flat at other places, flat, you know, it's the same tier that you're going to be able to get later. Um, trying to think through which sports you can kind of push and get a similar type of bet in a couple of rounds to the one you would have to take now. And that's how you, you know, you do those two V two decisions. I think Omni is a really fun event in terms of your draft skill, like which we talk about a lot in other sports. I think it will help you with your fantasy football drafts. Because you do need to make a lot of these types of decisions with cliffs and tiers and 
you're trying to get as much value out of the draft as you possibly can. At the same time, you want to have players that you really like and take swings on those players. It's a balance of taking your shots, but also getting value where you can get it. And once you learn that balance, like that's a, that's an important skill for success in fantasy, that drafting, uh, drafting balance is a skill. You wrote also, Lawrence, this makes the ADP dynamics less relevant. The room dynamics are more relevant due to the cliffs hitting in different spots. Love this point as well. I thought about this a bunch as I was drafting. Last year I did a, a thing I sent out, total ADP value. Uh, the people that had the lowest average ADP for all of their picks or what have you, they were typically beating ADP. And then the people who were typically losing from ADP – I don't think you want to be at the bottom of that list because you don't want to be constantly reaching way above ADP. But in I, I noticed in like I think my draft this year has been sharper than it maybe was last year to an extent, or at least like a lot of the times I'm looking at certain pockets of stuff, they seem to go. I'm not getting stuff to fall to me, and then I'm like, oh yeah, this is right as I planned it, which just happens naturally. It doesn't mean it's sharper. Sometimes it just happens. Um but my um feeling throughout this draft is that I've, I've been trying to, to, to get as much value as I can and really hit on, because you kind of want a unique build as well. And you're, you're trying to win the whole Omni cup. There's 150 people playing in this. So you want to have as many good options stacked to get, you want to hit as big of a home run as you can in your draft, right? Same thing as we try to do in, in best ball drafts, you like, it, the more you reach, the less likely you are to hit a complete home run with your draft. You want to let some value come to you so you can try to hit that complete home run and and really dominate. Um, oh, I'm going to do that for now. And really dominate uh, the actual draft and, and put yourself in a position to have a ton of total value. Having said that, the way my particular draft has gone – I still feel like I've put together a, a team that has enough total value. We can get enough 80s and this and that. And I, I'm, I'm playing the cliffs and tiers like Lawrence was saying, but I'm not beating ADP. I've been like basically reaching on a few guys. I'm going to be probably slightly below average in terms of total ADP value, even though I have a pretty good grasp of all the different ADPs. But some of that's because like some of the ADPs I don't think are right. And so if we go back actually to this, like, some of the ones that I passed on, like Connecticut Huskies fell in mine. I think it was the low. It was the low. The low is 50. That comes out of my league, league 16. I had multiple shots to take them, but I, I just told you guys how, like, I don't like to take a college basketball team early. I've been burned on that a lot. I think the, the UConn Huskies are one of the best bets to win the college basketball title, but they're also a decent bet to get up upset early or even – just lose a competitive game in the Sweet 16 because every team in college basketball is at risk of that. <clears throat> Once you get to the Sweet 16, you're talking about tough games. And, you know, if the other teams in their bracket take care of business and are playing well also, you can get to some matchups in the Sweet 16 that are like, man, this should have been a Final Four game, and your team just loses. And it's not even really their fault necessarily. They don't make the Final Eight. They get zero points. Um, so that was one, you know, in mine – again to lawrence's point like uh florida's another one that went kind of late i didn't want to take the the favorite in nhl they went i guess 49th isn't that late but a little bit behind their adp in mine um some of the sports that i didn't want to be prioritizing were sliding in my draft is the the, the headline um texas longhorns went 57th in mine um 11 picks behind adp I wasn't going to take a college football team that early, especially not Steve Sarkeesian's Texas Longhorns. We don't like him around here in UW. Um, so anyway, I, I completely agree with Lawrence's point. When when the sports that are falling are not the sports that you actually want or, or, or fit your build, you I mean, it's sort of similar to like, oh, hey, running backs are falling. Well, just keep taking receivers. Like you're going to get hit by the avalanche in the sports that you don't want to get hit by the avalanche in um, if, you, if you try to – bob and weave and you know pick up falling value in a sport like college basketball or something that you don't 
uh, want to prioritize. Now, some of you guys might like have insight into why UConn is like a legit favorite, and then that's fine. Like, I mean, go take them. I I just showed that I have taken like I took Georgia high. I've taken some of these teams um, high before, so it's not it's not something that I'm like um, dogging. Jake says, just want to say the league's awesome. Draft such a fun puzzle. Yeah, I mean that's what we've been talking about for an hour and fifteen minutes. It is such a fun puzzle. I think we could do this for like five hours. I'm not going to do it for that much longer. Uh, do really appreciate the, the nice comments. Appreciate your note, Donovan. Like the stream. By the way, I am going to do some more fantasy football stuff on the Stealing Signal screen. Uh, a stream. I did some in season for the Signals Gold subscribers. Uh, really enjoyed that. We did them weekly all year. Really enjoyed the Q and A's and some of that stuff. I like this format where I'm kind of talking with you guys in the comments and then kind of going off on some of my tangents, my stream of consciousness stuff that I like to do. And I want to do some of that for fantasy football as well, some solo stuff. Uh, so that will be coming, I think, in in this offseason. Uh, part of the reason I want to fire up this video is to just get myself moving in that direction. Um, so, yeah, subscribe to the channel as well. Like the stream, subscribe, do whatever you do on YouTube. I don't know the, the platform that well. Love the Netherlands lens pick. We talked a little bit about this. How much of this is already baked into the futures odds? Um this must have been in relation to me talking about a lot of the uh, paths that teams have and stuff like that. And this is a question I definitely ask myself, and it's a good one. The futures odds, though, are just to win. This is the thing that I've come to realize. This is one of these minor things that I probably have a little bit of an edge or, or some experience to help uh, after 10 years of doing this. The, the futures odds are, are to win. They're not to make a long run, right? And so, like, yes – to some degree, having an easy path to make a long run is going to make it more likely that you could then get lucky in the semis, in the finals, and then win the whole title. I have found that it it's not that baked into the futures odds, that you can start to dig into these things about, oh, this team might end up with a really easy path to the, to the, to the semis and get me 30 Omni Fantasy points but the odds aren't really reflective. I mean, because even if they make that run, I've looked at the odds at that point, and they're in the semifinals, they'll still wind up like 7-1 to one to win the title, even when there's only four teams left because they're the clear long shot. And so, you know, some of these odds have them at like, whatever, 14-1, to one, like Pakistan is, I don't know, 14-1, to 12-1 to one or something right now. If they do make that run to the semifinals, they're still only going to come down to like 7-1. to one. Maybe they'll be six or five, but they're going to be the underdog even at that stage because they're going up against three other really dominant teams. They're going to play two of them and have to beat them both. And, I mean, again, UW football made a run to the college football semifinals and then had the longest odds, and they were like 650 or 700 going into the college football playoff at that point, had really long odds still and beat Texas and and, and actually had a chance to win. I mean, you could have got them at – at like plus 700 before the Sugar Bowl against Texas. And I think that was a smart bet because they they won that game and then they ended up losing, giving up a lot of points late to Michigan. But that was a seven-point game most of the second half. A lot of missed opportunities for UW in that game. Uh, anyway, I do think the stuff about like odds to make a quarterfinal run or odds to potentially make the final – aren't in the futures odds as much as you might think they are because the futures odds are to win the title. Lawrence says he had Spain. They should be on the opposite side of the bracket. We're, that's when we're talking about the, the Euro stuff. I didn't get to these comments yet. Consiglary says, I hate you for adding cricket. It happens to be the only sport I've ever watched and just did not like. My best buddy from Pakistan still awful. T20 is better since there isn't the mid-bat pauses. I, I mean, look, I don't. I don't even watch cricket. To be honest with you, like some of these sports like NASCAR, I don't I don't watch them. But it's still fun to like bet on stuff. <laughs> so um it's a good sport for Omni. It's got like no clear title, but it's got like a, some clear tiers and like seven can win in a unique format with the round robin and then the next round robin. I kind of loved when I dug into the odds. I, I wasn't gonna add it necessarily. I had a, a buddy bugging me about it. And I dug in the odds, I was like, this is like it adds some fun to the draft. It adds some strategy to the draft. How are you going to get an option in cricket? How early do you want to go for it? 
Uh, like I took India in the second round of the Omni Cup. I just showed that. I do think the way to play it is probably to wait a little bit longer and hit like Pakistan if you can, right? Like somebody a little bit further down in that top seven. Golf and tennis are punts for me most of the time. That's sort of how I feel, although men's tennis I've definitely taken early, really early. And women's tennis I took early, but it was a little bit more of a crapshoot last year and the first year we did it uh, than I expected. College basketball, too, usually uh, unless a quality favorite slides. I know Tennessee latest this year. Did the same in NBA. Grabbed a sliding Knicks while already having the Suns. Yeah, NBA is one that I've been pushing, but I don't think that's necessarily right. I just haven't. I, I mentioned I think I should have taken the Celtics in the second round, but I do feel like the top of the NBA is less predictable this year than it was five years ago. I mean, you like for a stretch, it was like LeBron's going to make the finals every year, and also Golden State's going to make the finals every year. And, and for a little bit, it was like clear that it was going to be LeBron versus Golden State <laughs> for like a couple seasons. Um, and that didn't happen every year, but it was close. The Golden State was so dominant for a stretch there that I remember one year in – my big 16 person league, I was talking about somebody took them 101 and got the 80 out of it. But it was kind of crazy to do that because Djokovic was, you know, the 101, or uh, there were some other options. We had, I think, like the Women's World Cup that year, and the US for the Women's World Cup were, you know, really strong odds. And somebody was like bypassed both of those and was like, I'm going to take the Warriors. And, and they, they paid off on that. NBA's obviously come a long way since then. The Warriors have fallen off, LeBron has gotten old. Um, last year we had the Nuggets make their run. We've had the Bucks make a, a title run. The Heat came out of the East. They upset the Celtics, and they, they did what the Pan Florida Panthers did. And in hockey, they upset the the one seed and then went all the way to the the title. Um, so it does feel like there's like a lot of teams that can win. No clear favorite, and it's not. But it's, it's like 14 teams that can win or maybe only 12. And so that does fit everything I was saying about like the NHL and some of those other sports where it does make sense to be flexing it. It does make sense to be grabbing. Like I, I don't know why I've pushed NBA as far as I have. It's one that uh, – I mean, like I said, I don't think I'm a perfect expert in all this stuff. I've been sharing a lot of thoughts about the sports that I feel like I have a little bit of an edge in. NBA is one that I don't watch a lot. I don't know a lot about, and I'm not really ever comfortable at any point picking <laughs> because I don't, I don't even know who's healthy and stuff like that. Like I was looking at how the 76ers have lower odds and because Embiid's out. Like I just, that's how little I watch the NBA. I'm a Seattle guy. The Sonics left and I stopped paying attention not long after that. I used to love it growing up, but um, was never my, my main sport either. I like to play growing up. So not something that um, I'm an expert in, but, when I look at it objectively, I think it makes a lot of sense to be considering it for flexes and those types of things. Ben mentions top seeds in women's March Madness play home games the first weekend too. Oh yeah. I remember this. I actually um, thought about this. I was going to look it up. Didn't look it up, but I do remember seeing this last year, like watching a little bit of the tournament. That's helpful, obviously for them to be able to advance. You had to win the first three games, but they could potentially play home. And home, the first two, makes it a lot easier to get to the Elite Eight. Uh, we got a brain emoji. We got early flex and regret it from Donovan. What draft are you in, Donovan? I said we look at a few of these. I'm going to start doing uh, – for those of you who watch Ship Chasing, we do the sauce. I'm going to start like looking at some of your guys' teams, maybe sauce a couple of them. Donovan, throw in the comments what league you're in. I'm going <clears> to <throat> get there in a minute. Willis got hosed at UCL last year from that. I was talking about some of the upsets. I think maybe Bayern Munich or or um, I was talking about how it yeah how the draw went. I think Bayern Munich got the bad side. Maybe Willis had Bayern Munich. Consigliere had inner because of the bracket last season and not believing in Man City. Fifty percent correct. Love that. No idea about UFL this year, so I'm just waiting until the end to pick a team. So I I had no idea either. We have no odds out there. I did do a little bit of research. My feeling, I'll say this is I have a strong feeling now. I think the D.C. defenders are probably the best pick. Jordan Tangamu is back with them. He's been good in these spring leagues. He's like a underneath passer, uh, low A dot with some mobility. He's like an Alex Smith type, but it's like perfect for this type of league. You don't necessarily need to be big armed and push it downfield. Like no quarterback's perfect in, in this type of league. He doesn't take a, a lot of sacks because he's throwing short passes and he's scrambling. 
right? I don't think he takes a lot of sacks. I, I don't think he makes a lot of uh, mistakes and turns the ball over a lot either. Those are the things that, again, like keep you on schedule and that kind of stuff. A lot of these games are low scoring. It actually makes sense at this level to have that kind of high floor, low upside quarterback. They also got Kiki QT, who used to be good for the Texans. I have no idea what type of shape that guy's in or anything, but he was always a low eight out player and he was somewhat target dominant at times in his in his uh, NFL career. And again, as far as like this level of talent, I think Kiki QT could be like a legit slot receiver, chain mover, six catches per game type of guy if he's anywhere like he was. It was like five years ago now when he was at his best early in his career for the Texans for a little bit. <clears throat> but I think Tayamu and him, and then the fact that I, I did a little bit of research on it and saw that they were able to, they're able to um, like designate some of their players like keepers. And DC had the best record in the XFL last year, which was the better league, I think, of the two between the XFL and the USFL. They probably had the best roster of any of these eight teams last year. And they got to keep a lot of those players. Now they lose some of the players to the NFL and stuff, which is important. But they do get Tayamu back, their quarterback, and they're like some of their whatever linemen, defenders. I, I haven't dug into it a ton, but they didn't do like a whole new dispersal draft. They were able to keep some of their players. And I also read somewhere that they're like undefeated at home in DC. Like they've had have like a legit home field advantage. They do the like beer snake there and stuff. I think they're a pretty damn good bet to be one of the top two teams in the XFL division and make the playoffs. And so, I mean, I, I, I didn't even get them in Omni Cup because I'm pushing this sport as long as I can. But if I was at a point where I – and I'm probably going to wait till the end to pick a team as well. But if I was at a point where I was at least like round 15 or later and I thought everything else was really flat, I was kind of punting a lot of other sports and I wanted a team in the UFL, I think I would take them. The other ones that I have looked at, Birmingham got Matt Corral. I don't know how good he is, but Birmingham has won both of the two USFL titles. And they're a popular pick so far. Arlington won the XFL last year title because they upset DC in the playoffs, but they went like four and six in the regular season. DC went like nine and one, I think, something like that. Um, so yeah, they, they like we all know in football, like you can win one game, and and so Arlington beat them in the playoffs, and then went on and won the, or maybe I don't know, I don't know who beat who, I don't even know if they matched up. I think they matched up in the semis, and Arlington beat them. Um, but I'm not entirely sure, actually. Anyway, um, Arlington won the title. They are another one that's at least probably a decent bet because they did win the title, and they get their quarterback back as well, Luis Perez, who's been in these spring leagues for several years. I don't think he's quite as a, much of a positive as Jordan Tayamu, but I don't think he's bad. I think he's been interesting in the spring leagues when I've watched him a little bit. I've watched these spring leagues a little bit. Um I don't know about Matt Corral. Like, I mean, he could be, he's a big name, obviously. He was an interesting draft prospect uh, a couple years ago, but he also, like, he got hurt right away. They got cut. And then the, I think the Patriots grabbed him. And then I think they cut him right away as well. And I got the impression that, like, maybe he's, like, just not going to be that dude. Um, and that we, the Spring Leagues have had a lot of name value that has not done well. Johnny Manziel played there for a bit. But you had like Christian Hackenberg, Zach Mettenberger, some of these dudes that were like somewhat interesting in college football. And then um, Hackenberg was a second round pick for the Jets. And then, I mean, he sucked. I mean, the point is those guys weren't good. Pa uh, Paxton Lynch played a little. He was a former first round pick. He played a little bit in one of these spring leagues. He was not good. Um, the name value stuff doesn't always pan out. So I think I, I was a little bit hesitant with, with Birmingham. I've, I've seen a lot of positive stuff because they've won both their titles in the USFL. And I mean, they probably similar to what I was saying about DC probably have some good players that they were able to draw from, from last year's team, uh, good coach, good, you know, system, whatever. I don't even know if they have the same coach, but I think they do. Um, so those are the interesting ones. Uh, Memphis, I think has case Cookus, who Arif Hassan is always uh, tweeting about. I don't know if that's a bit or not. I haven't watched enough in the last couple of years when case Cookus has been playing, but I get the impression that case Cookus is at least, Decent for the spring leagues. I would be looking at the quarterbacks and stuff. Oh, odds are out if you're not mistaken. Send me that because I have been trying to find them. I'll add them to the site for sure. Uh, you were playing a dubs up UFL, but I didn't realize I couldn't take more than one. Yeah, in the um, 
Omni Cup with eight people per league, you're not able to take more than one because everyone has to be able to take at least one. The other league I was in with seven, I was able to double tap it. NFL teams often don't make playoffs next season after a run two. Yeah, that was kind of, I was talking about the Lions a little bit ago. Good point there, Consigliere. Padres and Mets, I'm sure, are very low owned. Yeah, there's some interesting teams like that in, in the MLB. Um, I'm so dumb. I definitely should have taken FSU instead of LSU Ole Miss just for that fact. Yeah, that's the thing about winning. I was talking about FSU. If they win the ACC, they'll probably get a an auto buy and get 20 points. Although, I mean, LSU or Ole Miss, if they're good or not, I, I agree. I think you want to take FSU over LSU or Ole Miss for that fact. Um, but if LSU or Ole Miss is good enough, like they probably have a better bet to make a run to the title. I don't know. FSU is pretty solid. I mean, FSU especially feels like a good bet because you can get the 20, but you might also have a good enough roster that they can win in the quarterfinals and, and make a run too. So who is the one team drafted at 20 in league five? Okay, so this is uh, the Jets. I did message the person and say, was that an accident or like a malfunction on the site? And and he or she, I can't remember, said, uh, big Jets fan, couldn't live with themselves if, if they didn't get the Jets. And I was like, all right, great. I mean, go for it. Take your pick, you know, do your thing. But I have been watching this and just like waiting for somebody else to take the Jets so this ADP will fall and not be here because eventually, you know, they'll get picked in some other leagues and it'll fall down. Although they're far enough down the odds that they're not going to get picked in all 19 leagues, I don't think. And that was part of, you know, me reaching out. I was like, I mean, you could definitely wait on them because, I, I mean, there's going to probably be leagues where they don't get picked. I hope they get picked somewhere else. So this ADP falls down, you know, at least into this range, into like where the Lions are or something. Um That's why I have the drafted column to show that, like, some of these ADPs are more robust. This one's not the most robust ADP. That's just one person, and every other every other league is still available. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about ADP. Oh, I guess I kind of did. I want to talk a little bit about like the Connecticut Huskies, some of these. But, I mean, some of these are really fun, too, like the Panthers. This is one of the things I love about Omni Fantasy. I want to point out the Panthers um, went as high as 8, went as low as 72, but they also went 9 in this league here in League 14. So it's like it's not like it was just one person was crazy on them. Two people at the eight nine turn thought they were worth a first second round pick, and but then also there's a league where they didn't go until seventy two. You know, more commonly they seem to be in like the third, fourth, fifth, whatever. I guess these are eight team drafts of so fifth, sixth, whatever round. Um, but you see some of these really wide ranges in just nine a sample of just nineteen drafts. And part of that's because of the point Lawrence made earlier about it's a little bit about the dynamics in the different leagues where um, or in the different, you know, our different drafts, the, the different 19 drafts, especially like as you get down into these ranges where, you know, the one where Columbus crew goes a hundred, I would guess probably a lot of the MLS teams went a little lower in, in, in league one and where they went 43, probably some other MLS teams went a little bit higher, right? Like it's, that was just an MLS thirsty draft and you're going to get i think that kind of variance from league to league and you want to bob and weave with that you you do you do want to uh play your draft to a certain degree so i don't even necessarily think in some cases where you wind up on the high side of adp if you're hitting the last of a cliff in that league and you wanted to get something in that league high and you know you're going to get a really great price on a different sport or that it's flat on a different sport or you think the market is just misvaluing an option in a different sport and you're not necessarily going to get a great price but you're going to get a good pick later then you know go for it make make your picks in that way so um yeah this i mean the the draft stuff is is fascinating you reach i teach that's right wells um I think you clarify that about the adjustments to the projected points, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh versus at Afghanistan. Uh, that was the pass through the bracket. So this gets back to Jordan's earlier comment where I was wondering how much of this is baked into the futures odds. I'm still catching up on the comments. Sorry, guys. Consigliere says, I'm a Clippers fan. I get free ADP value every draft. <laughs> exactly. This is what I was just talking about. It's uh, 
um, you get ADP value, and then also, you know, you got to watch your team. <laughs> the Clippers don't ever seem to make a run. Um, Donovan, sauce you. All right, good. We're at the sauce. I wish I could roll the clip. We're going to sauce a few teams now. We got Donovan in draft two. Let me pull up that from my links here. We're going to go stop screen sharing this. We're going to go here. You guys see that? Big board. Donnie Shea. Oh, man, you went MLS in the first round. Remember how I was saying how much of a crapshoot MLS is? I think, I mean, Inter-Miami is a really interesting one because of, like, having Messi and all those guys. I mean, it's the best possible bet you could make for AD in the history of MLS. But I tend to wait on MLS. Oh, wow, you went MLS in the fifth and the sixth, too? Three of your first six picks were all in the MLS. You were talking about you went early flex and you regret it. You also went two early NCAA Ws. Okay, Portugal's a good pick. West Indies is a good pick. Phillies is a good pick. You got on track a little bit here. But these three flexes, yeah, you're dust. <laughs> I mean, maybe the Eagles make a bounce back. Carolina's a good pick. Houston can make a run too. You you have the ability to have this stretch of your draft. Maybe the Battle Hawks, maybe the 76ers, who I'm looking at for NBA late. NBA gets healthy before the playoffs. You have the ability for this stretch to be – a really good stretch, but you're, yeah, you really box yourself out of elite points in the first six rounds. And I mean, the way MLS works, that's, I think the top three teams, I think the crew won it last year. Launch Los Angeles FC is like a, the one of the other best roster alongside inter Miami, but it does seem likely that one of these teams doesn't even, get points or, or, or gets eliminated at 20 or something like that. Um, and you need both of these teams to do really well as well. And they're not even the, the number one favorite. So you're, you're probably slim to get them to meet in the title LSU and Iowa. Cause South Carolina is like, they're even odds to win the title. They would be minus odds to get to the title. Your six first six rounds. Not my favorite, not my favorite, but uh, I do really like what you did here. A lot of good picks in here. Let's go see what you could have done in like the fifth. In the fourth, you took the Hawkeyes. Did you have an ICC team yet? Oh, here's a little trick you guys probably don't know. This draft breakdown, I got to get this moved somewhere where it's easier to find. You have to scroll all the way up to find that link. It tells you what you've picked. So Donnie Shea, he's got three MLS. He's got two NCAA. You did take, you just took the Sixers. But instead of the Sixers, you could have taken the Nuggets instead of flexing, you know, NCAA W. You, well, they just, Jamal Murray just got hurt. Oh, ICC was the other one I was going to look at. Who did you take? You do have an ICC. Yeah, you know me. Well, West Indies, that was a good pick, but I mean, you could have West Indies could have been your flex. I would have probably preferred in in your fourth round to be hitting on England in the fourth. That's a good value, I think. Um, fifth round, you could have done a lot of stuff. Yankees, sixth round, took the crew. Could have been hit on some of these. Corey Goff is one I wanted. Coco Goff. I was bummed not to get her. Yeah, it's tricky. Those rounds are tricky. Five, six, seven. I mentioned I didn't really like mine either. That's right in the spot where I didn't. I didn't. I told you I didn't like my picks. I didn't. I didn't flex, but I took some almost like reaches for what I'd like to do in those sports to try to prioritize options to get eighty because I thought that was right, but you know. I don't know. I don't know if it is right. Sauce it. You got sauced. Uh, draft 15, we got Jordan. That's one of our slow drafts. I'm sorry to those of you that actually care that have had to deal with the slow drafts. Um, what do we got? Is it Jordan Glenn or just Jordan? Just Jordan. Celtics, 
Iga Swiatek, I, I didn't know about her. I had her in a couple drafts last year. I went heavy on the on the high-end tennis options last year and got kind of burned because I did have Sabalenka in a couple, and she won the 80, but Swiatek only got 30. Rabikina did terrible, and they were the, the big three. Jesus. Drink your water bottle much? Anyway, um, love the England pick. Bayern Munich's an interesting one. We didn't talk a lot about Champions League, but the first leg's already been played. I don't know if you know this, Jordan, but Bayern Munich lost 1-0, and so they're at real risk of not advancing. If they advance, before that first leg was played, they had the second best odds. If they advance, they're a real good bet to get 80, and I think they're a good upside swing for Omni Cup because you want a team that can potentially dominate um and win the title but they have to overcome a 1-0 deficit because they lost in the first game first match they played two matches they probably will overcome that but it's a risky pick but they're down 1-0 right now in their two leg tie it's called which is confusing that just means they play two games a tie not that they tied in any kind of way. Um, I like LSU. I like Medvedev here. I think he's in, he's one of the four tennis players that can actually do something. He could be a surprise, win one of the majors if Djokovic starts to falter. Like one of the things I think about those big four in tennis, particularly as it relates to Sinner and Medvedev, I think the market is too certain that Alcaraz is the next best star. He probably is, but his odds are right with Djokovic. And like – Djokovic won the 80 last year, and we I showed the breakdown. He won it by a lot. He had like 24 tennis points. Alcaraz was second, but he only had like you know 16 or something. And the other guys behind Alcaraz weren't far behind him. Probably, I mean, I know that Alcaraz is thought to be as a like a prospect and as a as a and he's younger um, that he's going to be the next whatever, Djokovic, Nadal, Federer. Maybe he's not going to be that great, though, is sort of my point. Those guys were insane. And um, Medvedev was thought of that way not too long ago. He hit some injuries. He also got held out of some tournaments because of Russia invading Ukraine, and he's Russian, and and the Russian tennis players were not allowed at Wimbledon, and, and I think another tournament. can't remember exactly. Um but he, he got back on track a little bit last year, and he's very talented. He's a little bit older. It wouldn't be that surprising to me if he finished ahead of Alcaraz as the bigger threat. And same with Sinner, finishing ahead of Alcaraz as the bigger threat to Djokovic, at least for one year, and maybe Alcaraz needs a little bit more seasoning. It also wouldn't be surprising to me if Alcaraz took the 80, right, and is just that good and, and goes in and takes – this is the year he overtakes Djokovic. That wouldn't surprise me. But I do think you know Alcaraz won as high as 101 in a couple drafts. Getting Medvedev in the sixth is a similar bet to Alcaraz, I think. Maybe that'll prove to be faulty, but that's what I think. And so I like the price at that point. Like the Tigers, like getting a, a good – Euro's another one where how many teams can actually win Euro? I talked about how there can be some upsets and some teams that make deep runs. Even mentioned how Croatia made it all the way to the final a few years back, but then they lost to France. France still won it, right? It usually in these big soccer tournaments still does wind up being one of the top teams. Some of the top teams don't make it all the way, but one of the top teams do win it. I like getting a team from like Spain as like a lower part of that tier of the top seven or so nations um, at a good price. I think that's a good pick. Hamlin, I could do without. I don't know. That's probably not my favorite. McElroy, similar. I think you can get a. Uh, Decent PJ bets a little later. Although it's, I mean, these are good. These are fine prices. Ninth round macro where he's the highest expected points. I talked earlier about how the winners into golf typically are the, the very big names. The McElroy can certainly win a major and then consistently compete at the others. And so then he could win the 80. I like Arizona's profile and I do my research into college basketball. I look a lot at Ken Palm. Um, I like teams that are balanced on both sides, offensively and defensively, play with a little tempo, maybe a little bit more of an offensive lean in terms of their efficiency. I've had a lot of success in the bracket pools over the years and have dug into this stuff a lot. 
Arizona profiles with their Ken Palm metrics. I haven't launched, watched a lot of them, but profiles well. And so that's another sport where I actually want to trust my own ability to pick. And, 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 um, and I've been doing that in some of my drafts. And uh, Arizona is one that fits some of the criteria that I like. So they wind up being a good pick in my mind. Rangers suck. Mariners are going to beat them. Two NFL teams, one from the AFC and NFC, both that have you know some potential to grow. They're not bad rosters. I think this is interesting. Take a couple swings at a sport that you haven't hit yet. Altogether, a pretty strong draft, I think, Jordan. I like this. Not really uh, saucing you very well. Donovan had fun, I think, with my sauce. Willis is in. Oh, am I am I not even sharing? Oh, this is hilarious. I'm not even sharing. Um, I just talked through Jordan's entire draft without sharing it. That's brilliant. It's over here on the left. Celtics, Iga, England, Bayern Munich, Tigers, Medvedev, Spain. You heard me mention almost all of these. I went through the whole thing. I said the Rangers suck. But otherwise, um, pretty strong draft for me there. Good work. Willis was next. He said League 4, sauce away. Let's go pull that up, and I'll make sure to actually show – the board this time. I'm sorry, I'm such an idiot. Willis, big board. Man City at 102. That's an interesting one. Oh, wow. Your draft, South Carolina went all the way down to five. I think I might have went South Carolina over Man City. I, I mean, I think the Aces were the clear 101 personally. Um, I think I would have went South Carolina two, Man City three, but it's obviously a good pick. Uh, Nuggets in Australia. I mentioned liking liking cricket, getting into the cricket streets early. <clears throat> I don't like this pick, Connecticut Sun. I'll tell you why. I've mentioned how many teams that can actually win the title in these sports. I realized at a certain point when I was thinking through WNBA, there's only 12 teams total. So the likelihood that the Connecticut Sun get at least 20 is high, uh, very high. Eight of the 12 teams are going are gonna to get something. But the Las Vegas Aces and the New York Liberty have such high odds, even in only a 12-team league because they're like these super teams. And they met in the title last year, and they're going to again this year almost certainly. Um, they have such high title odds that there's almost no chance a team like Connecticut in that next tier can get through both of them. I mean, there's like a very slim chance they can beat even one of them in a three-game or five-game series, whatever they're doing. I can't remember. They've, they've, they've elongated the playoffs so that there are, are series is now, and that reduces the variance. The better team is going to win more often than not in a series, and uh, it's probably going to be the Aces and the Liberty. It would take a Her Herculean effort for any other team to beat one of them in the playoffs, and then you'd have to go and play the other one in the finals. Like you'd beat one from the semis and play the other one in the finals. They have, I mean, I think this is a, a, a pick that has a really high likelihood of getting you 20 or 30 points and a really low likelihood of getting you 50 or 80, and it's too early for me to take them at 502 and you're – like it's similar to what I was talking about with Zverev. I did that late. I don't want to do that in the fifth round. I want to be seeking 80-point picks in the fifth, personally. But I do really like these first four picks. I like the Astros swing. I mean, it, you're getting into the range where it makes some sense to go after a high upside MLB team. I mentioned uh, on Donnie's that I don't love the early MLS picks, but, I mean, Los Angeles FC is one of the better teams on paper. So, um, And seventh round is not, like, super early. Uh, Edmonton. I'm totally fine with going NHL at this point. You hit an NCAA team a little earlier maybe than I would like. Cowboys, a little bit of faith there, and Dak turning it around. Belgium is an interesting pick here. We went through there. Uh, we went through the Euro pools. I think Belgium has a pretty safe group to advance out of and could be in a decent spot in the next round. Um 
Logano I took in one of my drafts. Hovland is a nice price at 13. He's like the fourth highest odds of all golfers. You get a, a flex at, at basketball. I mentioned not loving the flex at basketball, but I think the Jayhawks are probably a little bit undervalued because they've had some regular season losses relative to their true talent. I mean, they're, they're, they always recruit well. They have, they have a good team. Blue Jays are a good pick. Sitsopis is a good pick here. Sim, very similar to my Zverev pick I was talking about. <clears throat> LSC Tigers here. You mentioned if you could do that back, you would probably take Florida State based on some of the stuff we were talking about. It looks like Florida State went 17 6 a couple picks after. Good draft. Good draft. Just don't love the, uh, the Connecticut Sun pick. But all the rest of them, you know, don't necessarily love the MLS. Don't necessarily love – UNC here when you could get Kansas here. But I think all the other, I mean, a lot of these other picks are good. And there's definitely room to stack 80s. If you hit on some of these earlies, you could hit on Edmonton, like we talked about, like an NHL team in the eighth round can win the title. Los Angeles FC can win it as well. Uh, North Carolina could win it. Um, you certainly have given yourself enough outs to win titles, other than I think these guys aren't going to be winning the WNBA title. Everything else looks looks strong. Um, where was that comment? Odds are out now for UFL as of today. I got to get those on the site. DC defenders have the snake easy pick. That's what I was talking about. Didn't see odds yesterday, so of course they came out today. Only four UFL teams left. Yeah, Jacob said the same thing. Also lets you root for the beer staff. I'm in. I'm in with the beer staff for sure. Might go with the uh, San Antonio Brahmas for destroying. Let's let's go look at the uh, UFL odds. Where where are they, guys? Are they on? Uh, I'm not seeing them on DraftKings. Let's just go Google UFL futures odds. What do we got? See, I keep getting Florida stuff. All right, I'm just going to wait for you guys to tell me. Oh, Willis mentioned he didn't even know that uh, NCAAW was, was in it when you picked. That, that'll that catch you. <laughs> You're welcome for the sauce. Um. <clears throat> What do you guys tell me? DraftKings has UFL odds. Where? I saw NFL, CFL, and college football when I clicked on football. Maybe I don't have them in my... I'm just going to go Google DraftKings UFL odds. Did you mean showing results for NFL odds? <laughs> there they are. All right, let's get this. Oh, what? I clicked the link and it. So they're on. This is amazing. All right, let me present this. Give me one second. Let's go. Uh, my Google results. I have a list of them. First, I got did you mean DraftKings NFL odds, which I already undid their you know immediate thing, a list of them. But when I click on it, they're already not listed on DraftKings anymore. It takes me to all football, and all they have is CFL, college, and NFL. However, because Google has the has this, so Birmingham has the highest odds. Interesting. DC defenders are up there. I mentioned Arlington. Memphis with Case Cookus shows up here. I was not in on St. Louis. They're tied for the second best odds with DC. And uh, the Houston Ruff Roughnecks look like they're in a good spot as well. Michigan and San Antonio are the, the big dogs. All right. Well, I feel pretty good about my analysis. At least I didn't have it completely backwards or anything. I mean... Birmingham and Arlington are just past champions, but I like that I was prioritizing D.C. I, I like this number, plus 380. I might go bet on them a little bit. 
Uh, very hard for me and Ami to take favorites because you pay so much more respect to the field. Um, like in what sport? What do you mean? You have to take a favorite in the first round at some point. I mean, it's kind of like the, the draft structure kind of layers it out. So I don't know that I totally understand. Um, what we're saying here. DraftKings has UFL odds not showing up in my state. Maybe that's what I'm running into. Um, can we get a breakdown of all teams only taken in one league? Well, we're not done yet. I mentioned the Jets. I mean, yeah, I'll do this, but I don't know how much fun it's going to be. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'm down for whatever. Um, so I, I put a conditional format that will highlight in yellow the ones that were only taken in one team. I talked about the Jets. I'm just hoping that their ADP comes down. I do think the Jets are like a fun play with Aaron Rodgers back, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall. Like, I still think like a lot of people want Robert Sala fired. I still think Robert Sala is a pretty good defensive coach. The Jets' defense was incredible this year. I think if Aaron Rodgers stays healthy, the Jets are good. Like they have a good year. Garrett Wilson was gonna have a strong year. Brees Hall looked good. They do need to, you know, work on their offensive line a little bit, but I don't think you fire Sala, who put together a strong defense. Although I think he, he made terrible decisions with the quarterback position all year. Like I thought they should have tried as many different things as they could have tried at QB. I wrote about this a ton, stealing signals, and early in the year, you can't just let Zach Wilson play all year. Uh, you know what you have there. It's a waste of a good defense and a potentially competitive season if you can hit on you know anything which like the the Bengals wound up hitting on Jake Browning you know Joshua Dobbs was an example a few years back you had the Eagles Nick Foles that go to the Super Bowl they win the NFC championship over Case Keenum who took the Minnesota Vikings to an NFC championship like sometimes you these journeyman backups hit like they should have been on the phone before the trade de trade deadline trying to find those types of quarterbacks, trying to find multiple. And you can find them reasonably cheap, not necessarily if they're in a stable backup job. But there's a, I wrote about a lot of names they should have tried. I thought that was all stupid. I don't think you fire him for it. Number one, because I don't think it was really his decision. If I had to, had to guess, I think Woody Johnson was like, no, we're not going to do that because we already made all these promises to Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers and we don't want to create controversy. Like They basically just gave up on their season when, when Aaron Rodgers got hurt because they wanted to think about 2024 and they didn't want somebody else to have success and create some kind of controversy. That's like, Oh, well we got to play that other guy. I think that's dumb, but I don't think you fire Sala like a lot of people want it. Cause I do think Sala is a good coach. And I think there's reason to be optimistic about the jets. I honestly think they're an interesting late round tip pick. Um, looks like the next one is Hideki Matsuyama has gone 86. Somebody really liked him. I would have waited um, a little longer to try to take him, which, I mean, is evident by the fact that he's only been picked in one league. Um, but if you have a preference in golf, like, he could go, you know. I mean, there's sports like that, your guy can go at any time. So I don't mind locking that person in if you want to lock him in. I don't know anything about college women's college basketball, but somebody's a big Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan. I mean, most of these are, like, they're fans of the team. People just want to have them on their on their Omni team, and I get that. Like, take them. You don't want someone else to accidentally draft them. Um, Andre Rublev, he actually finished with 20 points in Omni a couple of years ago. He's been an okay tennis player. That His odds to win tournaments are very low, but he could be another one of those consistent guys that could sneak into the 20-point tier. Um, I saw – Tyler Reddick's odds were, I think, decent. You know, like he's in a tier with some of these other – he's probably not that different than Logano and Truex in, in terms of real odds. Croatia, um, talked about them a little bit. But their their main guy that was a stud a couple years ago, Luka Modric, is I think out. Or he's like done now. He's too old. Cam Smith. I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like – like most of these other ones are just – it's pretty, it's, you know, we're getting to the late stages. Like, yeah, maybe it's a little bit of a reach, but we're outside pick 100, you know. He's only been drafted once, but he's outside pick 100. Like, every other 
option around them has a high pick that's better than a hundred that's higher than a hundred, you know? So it's not that crazy, I guess, is my point. These guys are going to fall down. Um, an average ADP a little bit, but like somebody liked them. And once you get past pick a hundred, go for it. So anyway, um, we're not, I mean, once we're done, it'll be interesting to look at all the ones because people will have leverage. They'll be the only one who has that team. Roll the clip for Sauce. Sauce me if you want. Have time. Draft 13. We got Ryan saying 17. I think maybe I'll just do a couple more. But let's go look at Lawrence. And Lawrence is obviously, he's sitting here saying, um, Sauce me if you have time. Like he doesn't know what he's doing, but he uh, he's good. He pays a lot of attention to the Omni stuff. He has shared some thoughts earlier. He obviously knows how to how to draft. So I'm sure his team is solid. We got the Liberty at 104. I mean, you didn't even get the top team in your sport at 104. Whew. Like that pick back. No, I'm just kidding. I took the Liberty at 106. Um, I would have taken Djokovic. For sure. Uh, I think the Liberty, I think Djokovic is a better bet for 80. Liberty are a really strong bet for at least 50, though. And I, like I said, I took them at 106 because I think they're a strong bet for 80 or, or for 50. And I think they're a better bet to get to 80 than they are probably to get to 30. Like there's a better chance they can beat the Aces than they get upset prior to that, that finals matchup. Sweet attack. We'll see. Um, England, Iowa, Spain, Yankees. I've taken you know a bunch of these picks. Barcelona is tied one-one after one leg in returning home. Their odds to advance are pretty strong. I was looking at them as even a potential flex. He gets a good price on Kevin Durant in the eighth round. I thought the Suns. I thought the Suns were are like undervalued, but I don't know a ton about call about basketball. I mentioned this, but like they have the star power. Like they have Kevin Durant. Can't they go on a little bit of a run? Um. Ravens, Canucks. I think the Ravens are probably not a great pick. This isn't like really expensive, but they were the number one seed this year and still didn't make it. It's a really competitive AFC. The odds that they're the number one seed again is are probably low. They're probably gonna have to play road playoff games against like the Bills or the Chiefs. Um, they're really good, obviously, but they don't have like a rookie quarterback contract or any of those types of things working in their favor. So. Probably a little bit challenging for them to live up to their uh, lofty odds, where they're like the third or fourth highest odds. I think they're they had a strong year and that pushed their odds up, but they're typically around like seventh in odds, and they probably belong around seventh in odds. Canucks, Volunteers, Wolverines, Knicks, Truex, Netherlands. These are all pretty solid picks. I don't really have anything to. I mean, once you get to those late rounds, it's kind of like do what you want to do, Willis. Can handle the heat. Donovan, oh no. Oh no, the MLS. League 17 for Ryan. Let's take a peek at that. What do we got here? Ryan. Djokovic at 108 is a good pick. He goes England Euro at 201. 202 was the Dodgers. Alcaraz, neither of the tennis guys went in your first eight picks. Swiatek goes 204. Who would have been the other pick? Who was the top nine in ADP? Just sucked. India went in your top eight. Oh, Inter Miami. Oh, Inter Miami went. India went seven. Oh, was England the other part of the top eight? No, they're outside the top eight. Oh, the Celtics were the other team that finished in the top eight. So by ADP, oh, wait, no, the Celtics went at 106 in your draft. Who am I missing? Oh, it was Alcaraz. So you, by ADP, you should have went Djokovic Alcaraz. For obvious reasons, you did not. Um, Djokovic, England, England, 
I mean, jeez. This guy's like, have a have a muffin or some uh, some some English sausage, some really bland, flavorless food, I guess, right? And then you go German over here, Bayern Munich. Then we go back to Northern Ireland with uh, Rory McIlroy. We have a Serbian in the first round. This is a lot of Europeans to start this draft. A little, little, few too many, more than I'm comfortable with, I think. We got back to Connecticut here in the sixth round. I talked about not really loving the early WNBA pick. A little bit ago, Colorado, Byron. I I think NASCAR is pretty flat in the first like eight to ten drafters. So I don't ever really love taking like the very top NASCAR pick just because I think I can get similar bets several rounds later. Um, I, that said, like he is a better bet. Like it's a similar bet, but it's the later picks, but they're not as good of a bet as William Byron. So like it, you, you'll you could win. The 80 with William Byron. I Some of these ones that have sort of flat tiers, but not totally flat tiers, like golf is like this. I struggle with like maybe the eighth round price is actually fine or Rory in the fifth round. I talk about this with golf. Maybe the fifth round price is fine. If he wins the 80, it'll definitely be fine, but there's some risk as well. So it's it's not a top three pick is what I'm saying. You're not, you're not doing it really, really early. Um, 508, it's the last pick of the fifth round. It might as well have been 601, right? Like, if you win the 80 with these guys, these picks, like, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna you're gonna be glad you took them there. And I do sometimes take golfers and NASCAR drivers in these ranges of omni drafts some years. Kind of depends on you know what I like in those ranges. Um, Colorado feels like a good pick, Alabama and the Suns. I've talked positively about both already. On this stream, Madrid, what's Madrid's deal? Atletico Madrid, Champions League. What did they do in the first leg? They lost to Inter 1-0 in the first leg. So Inter is the pretty heavy favorite to advance. And so in the 11th round, taking Madrid... A little bit tricky. I took Inter in like the fifth round because I'm already maybe already writing off Madrid too much. It wouldn't be that surprising if Madrid won one to zero in the second round and then forced um, or the second leg and then forced extra time and you know ultimately it just goes to extra time and then penalty kicks or whatever. Um, and I believe the second leg is in Madrid. First leg was at San Siro, which is in Milan. Yeah, that's Inter's. So Inter won 1 0 in Milan. Madrid gets to return home. They're down, but they get to return home. Um, interesting. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have taken them in the 11th, but I'm probably a little too confident in Inter when I took them in the fifth in mind. They might not even make it out of this round. Because uh, Atletico Madrid is like a legit. Team before the first leg, Inter and Madrid and Atletico, whatever you call them, they were like neck and neck in futures odds. Now though, there's a gap because Inter got the 1 0 in the first leg. Um, I hear good things about the Connecticut Huskies, don't know a lot about them. You guys are in love with Dallas. I, I mean, they kept Mike McCarthy, <laughs> that's that's my concern, right? I, I think they should have fired Mike McCarthy. Um, you got the Tar Heels. You know these are these are fine picks down here. You got the UFL favorite by DraftKings odds. Cantlay, you mentioned earlier, was a flex in PGA with Rory. I'm fine with it. Probably not my favorite use of a flex, but I'm fine with it. Thanks for the sauce. Since I effed up, I think I'm going to make a dummy roster in one of the leagues and play along that way. Oh, I like that. That's a fun idea. Yeah, you missed uh, signing up. We talked about that, Consigliere. Sorry about that. Um, and it's funny. We have some drafters that have not done a good job of sh showing up. Maybe I'll message you. I, I've, i like, we already are, like, 10 rounds in, but some of the slow drafts could probably use a replacement. So maybe I'll... Uh, See if you want to hop in, even though a bunch of picks have already been made for you. Iga is steady, consistent, kind of this Zverev thesis, but she wins titles. Tuchel is good at tournament wins. Kane needs a good tourney. Munich is a good pick. 
for Champions League, right? So Kane is their their main goal scorer. Tuchel must be their coach. Bayern Munich. I was talking earlier about overcoming their 1-0 first leg deficit. I took them in a league. I like the the swing for um for 80. Gretch, you just always need a producer. I mean I do. If anyone wants to be a producer, let me know. There's 13 of you here. I'm trying to expand on the YouTube stuff, but I got kids and other responsibilities. I can't like, I made the, the thumbnail for today. It only took me like a half an hour, but I mean, I don't know how people make thumbnails for every show. <laughs> there, a lot, a lot of them are, it's because they're like 25. I mean, Pat and Peter, my age, but like a lot of the, a lot of the big YouTubers are like younger. When I was younger, I would have, I would have definitely had the time to figure all that stuff out. Uh, we talked about Willis's stuff. Donovan's mentioning where the UFL odds are. Willis linked me in the Omni Discord. How do I get action on that Google Sports book? Um, is that real there? Who's your favorite 20th plus round darts? You'd be happy to hop in. You like that idea. Nice. Need pick. You just want to make a pick. You were like waiting for to be on the clock maybe. Um, cool. I'll let you know, Consigliere, if I uh, locate a good spot. I'm sure I will. Because um, I need to get some of these drafts to pick up. They need to be finished by Monday. And there's some people that have really held up some of these drafts. And it's been kind of frustrating. Favorite 20th round darts is a fun way to kind of close this down after a couple hours. Um, let's go to the ADP. Because it'll at least, I mean, I don't know that the best 20th round darts are going to show up there yet, but it'll at least give me an idea of the leagues and stuff. Um, oh, you know where else I can go is... My own 10 team draft. So in that one, I took. Oh, a fun one is PSV in UCL in the Champions League. We were just talking about how the first leg has already happened. Um, I took them as a flex late in my main league because. I believe they tied in the first leg against Dortmund. Um, but Dortmund's not like a dominant team. It's like the weakest matchup. There's no like legit favorite. Dortmund's favored, but they both they yeah, they they both scored a goal. They went one one in the first leg. I believe PSV was the home team and they will be heading back to Dortmund, Germany. That is correct for the second leg, but uh, PSV can go like super, super late and has a legit shot to get 20 points. They're basically a coin flip. Like their odds to advance are, um, I think they're like plus 170. I mean, they're they're not great, but they're not terrible. Uh, so anyway, I took them as a, I took them as a, a flex. I think, um, MLS picks can be interesting. 20th plus round ones. Um, I don't really know how to research the MLS well, but I found like a couple sites that like write season previews and kind of just trusted the ones that were saying that gave me like a synopsis and said, you know, this is what their upside is. I can't remember the site that I found, but I found a site that I, that was like, that, you know, this team's upside is make a run for the title. Or this, <clears throat> this team's upside is hopefully make the playoffs. And so it kind of gave me an idea of, like, based on that one author's opinion, who are sharp, longer odds, MLS bets to maybe make a run. Who knows? Um, most of my late-round picks in this draft are <clears> – so a lot of what I do in the 20th round is I, I wind up punting leagues – so my last three picks in my main draft were men's tennis, women's tennis, and college football. And I was talking earlier about how when there's a lot of options, if I don't get, especially if I don't get like one of the favorites, like if I don't get Georgia in college football or I don't get uh, um, Djokovic, I'm going to just probably punt that sport and legit 
punt it, like take it at the very end. And so my last three picks were filling needs. I hit my flexes in the like round 12 to round 16, 18 range and get good flexes usually. So there's not really a lot of like, I, I, cause I, I, I don't want 20th plus round dart throws. I think that's where it gets tricky. You get that late. Having said that, like if you're in a small enough league, um, I definitely really like the Texans price. Like they have a QB on a rookie contract. They were really good this year. I think CJ Stroud's definitely poised to be good and take a step forward. We saw the Bengals in Joe Burrow's rookie contract not just become competitive in the AFC, but propel to where they won the AFC. And then the next year they made the AFC um conference championship and now they're going to have to pay some of their guys and it's going to get trickier for the Bengals. that rookie window is really where you can maximize you know and so it would like i was just talking about being concerned about the ravens a little bit because like they did pay lamar jackson a lot of money it is a little bit trickier at a certain point like i think the dynamics of the nfl are such that the texans are a reasonable bet to make as long of a you know to make an afc playoff run relative to the Ravens. I was almost going to say they're a better bet, but like the odds suggest they're twice as long odds, but I think they're like basically equal. The Texans are um, to, to the Ravens. who I think are probably a little overpriced um, and they're, they're even behind like the dolphins. Like I like the dolphins, but the dolphins are probably going to pay Tua, and it's going to make things a little trickier for them. And Tua's probably not good enough to really provide a ton of surplus value with that contract. I don't know. I don't know about the Dolphins. But, I mean, I think they're at least interesting, but I don't I don't know if I think that they have the upside. I think the Texans have the upside. That's sort of the point. It's like, yeah, they could fail, but they have the upside to, to propel right up to where they're like, you know, using their cap space wisely. Now, it is interesting. It's the cap space is you – know, the, the cap number jumped a lot higher than people thought. So the cap space isn't as beneficial because teams have more cap space than they were planning for. And it's going to make things like some free agents are going to get big contracts, but also it's going to make it easier to fill in your holes. I think in the free agent market, it doesn't, it's not just an equivalent rise. We're like, Oh, well, isn't it going to be, you know, harder for everyone? Like not really. I mean, the, I saw some really sharp analyses uh, that people were pointing out that the teams that saved cap space, or are in like the Texans example have a rookie contract QB contract so they th that's one of their big advantages they have cap space they can add veterans they get hurt by the fact that the salary cap increased by so much more than expected the teams that don't have any cap space get get the benefit because suddenly they actually have a little bit of flexibility when they shouldn't have had any and the teams that have should have had a ton of flexibility. Part of the advantage they have is that other teams don't have flexibility. Slightly more flexibility for them is not a benefit as much as those other teams that were going to be not able to get into the bidding. Now having some money to get into the bidding becomes a problem. And so anyway, a team like the Texans this year may not be able to benefit uh, a ton from that. Um, longer term, trend of of rookie QB contracts being really helpful in NFL sleeper picks and those types of things. But if you want to look for like this year's Texans, like I was looking, dude, I mean, this is, you'd have to be in a deep league, but like the commanders and the Patriots have some of the worst odds of any team, right? They're like 30th, 31st, but they're also picking in the top three. <clears throat> the bears are like maybe 22nd in odds. They're picking first. All those teams are going to take a quarterback likely if one of those quarterbacks is C.J. Stroud, like last year the Texans were in the bottom three in odds at this time of year, I think, or they were close. Like they, Even after they took Stroud, it was like they're going to suck. They don't have anything else. They sucked last year, uh, the year prior. Like they had Davis Mills playing quarterback. At this time last year, it was like the Texans are garbage, even though they have the second pick. Like their roster is garbage. But they were able to draft Stroud, who was a massive hit, and – to be fair, like probably none of the three quarterbacks in this year's class will, will be as good as Stroud was as a rookie because he just did something incredible this year. However, people think Caleb Williams is you know is just that good, and maybe he can do that for the Bears or what have you. There's some 
uh, options I'm saying for to be this year's Texans this year um, in the late rounds. So NFL is a sport that I, you know, I would take some stabs at sometimes because I do think there's some plausibilities there. I, it, it would also be more like to this question about um, favorite twentieth plus round darts. It would be more about the sport. So like MLB, I think you can take twentieth round darts. Um, let me go right back and and look at an MLB list so I can give you like vague thoughts on. Oh, Arizona Diamondbacks stealing bananas co-host Sean Siegel was an Arizona Diamondbacks fan. He's excited. They added Jock Peterson and Randall Grichuk, who are both good platoon advantage hitters, and the Diamondbacks use platoons to their advantage already. They have really low odds because they were a pretty surprising run to the World Series, but they made the World Series last year and are probably going to continue to try to – win on the margins in, in a way that in day-to-day -day in baseball, if you play the platoon advantages and all that stuff, it probably does provide more of a benefit than, than people really understand. So I do like them as a late round pick. Um, somebody mentioned the, the Mets and Padres, like some of those teams, they're kind of like selling off some assets because they had their uh, luxury tax numbers super high and that kind of stuff. But I, I mean, I think you can take swings at some NL teams like that. Oh, the Cleveland Guardians last year were the uh, AL Central favorites. I took the Twins in some leagues because I thought it was like close, and the Twins had a pretty good roster. The Twins are now the clear favorites, and everyone else in the AL Central is like really low odds. Like the Chicago White Sox were the other one that was decent, and they have fallen – pretty far in odds and don't look like they're in a great spot right now. If you look at it, the Twins are the only team in current M uh, uh, MLB odds from the AL Central. Let me just pull it up. Futures. Winner. The Twins have 20-1 to 1 odds to win the World Series. The next best team in the AL Central is actually the Detroit Tigers. They're 60-1. to 1 which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 times 2, 18. That's 19th highest in the league. Like, very, very low. The Guardians come in at 70 to 1. The White Sox are at 250 to 1. The Royals are actually higher than that at 130 to 1. Um, I think, like, just betting against the Twins is fair. And if you win your division, you don't get the automatic 20 points, but you do just have to win one wild card series at that point, and you get to host it. It's a three-game series, and you get to host all three games. So the Guardians to go win the AL Central and then win a three-game playoff series and make it to the next round is like – that's what people thought they could do a year ago. And they or they had done it the year prior, 2022. They made the – they they won the division, won their wild card series, and made, and got 20 on the fantasy points. Um. I think their roster is a little bit weaker now, but they still have some of that talent. And again, the division is weak. You're kind of just betting against the twins. You're betting on like the twins having some health issues. And then it's like a pretty open division at that point. I don't think the tigers are actually like that great. I'm going to pull up the guardians roster. Yeah. So they have the Andres Jimenez guy, uh, second baseman, who projects like as a 4.3 war player. He's good. Jose Ramirez is their superstar, 4.8 war guy. They still have Stephen Kwan. Ramon Loriano is another dude that's pretty solid. They have both Bo Naylor and Josh Naylor. I don't know which one of those guys I know, but I don't know the other one. I didn't realize there was two Naylors. Shane Bieber is still their ace. Not really a super deep pitching staff as far as what I know of these guys, but oh yeah, their closer's good too. Emmanuel Classe. Like that's a pretty good roster. That can win the AL Central. Anyway, I'm kind of just um, throwing out random thoughts now, but yeah, I would look at the sport more so than the, um, the specific team, but guardians guardians are one that I'll, I'll give you as well that I think are fun. Um, So 
Sri Lanka or Bangladesh and ICC. I think I already mentioned them. I'm kind of like clicking through right now, trying to see if there's any other ones that stand out to me. But oh, my Washington Huskies in college football. Like they lost their coach, they lost their whole roster, but they like the, their new coach, Jed Fish. I'm at least excited about it. I watched him film from Arizona's offense last year, and it's a it's a intelligently designed offense. And then they got – they retained the quarterback that was going to be their quarterback next year that was a transfer, and they got a transfer from Arizona that was like a freshman or had originally declared to Arizona or whatever. He decided to, to come to UW. And, like, their other freshman QB on their roster that was going to transfer out when DeBoer left decided not to. They have, like, three quarterback options, which I think more is better, right? Like, gives you some uh, potential if one of them's not great, what have you. I don't think you'd have probably primed to contend this year, but they're going to the Big Ten, and all you really got to do is probably finish, like, fourth in the Big Ten, and you have a shot to to make the, the college football playoff. <clears throat> I think their odds are probably lower than they should be. They're like way down the list, and I mean they did they had a lot of turnover, but I just I don't know. I, I you got to believe, you got to believe. All right, guys. Oh yeah, Dante said a few of my friends are doing Omni on around. And I've made it even more degenerate by adding a ton of other sports. Nice. Yeah, I, I've gotten this message a lot of times. People wanted me to add stuff that I didn't have or they want to change rules or things like that. So they've gone and created their own stuff. And I'm a huge fan, supporter of that. Go for it. Love it. Um, very cool. Um, Jordan says, thank you. Thank you. Great contest. Love it. Um, appreciate you guys. I'll probably do some fantasy football stuff on this channel over the next few months um, in the off season. Subscribe, whatever. Go subscribe at stealingsignals.substack.com. Omni Fantasy, ship chasing, stealing bananas. I don't got much else to add. This was fun. Good two and a half hours talking Omni Fantasy with my guys. Peace. <laughs>